Hey y'all, Shane here. You love Amazon, don't you? You do a lot of shopping there, right? I think we all do. <laughs> well, one great way you can support Lip Under Attack is by doing all of your shopping through our Amazon affiliate link. It costs you nothing extra, and we get a cut. Getting ready to purchase a bunch of books on Austrian economics? A knife for your bug out bag? Bulk additions to your food storage? Make your purchase by first visiting libertyunderattack.com forward slash Amazon. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Amazon. And thank you in advance for your support. I'm sure some folks will still participate in politics, hoping they can find a benevolent ruler to at least mitigate uh, some of the infringements in place now. But guys, that's, that's, that's a road to nowhere. It's a road to beatdowns on the street, extortion, and democide, with an even greater loss of freedom year after year, election after election. And it's, it's one of the most vicious falsehoods perpetuated throughout the ages. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, naive notion that politics can set you free. Uh, and that's why I've been so harsh on the anti-libertarian libertarian party, uh, because, uh, as I've said before, the people are sick of politics, the left-right paradigm, so what do they do? They give them more politics. It's, uh, it's the most uh, uh, insincere and ingenuine thing you can do to a fellow human being. It really is dangerous to be an anarchist, and it, it will only get, I mean, it, you know, as per kind of the, the stages of Agoras and that Konkin kind of laid out, it, it, it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better, but, you know, when, when's it, when's it going to start getting better? You're listening to Liberty Under Attack Radio, and now your host, Shane. And welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism and action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you, as always, from the communist state of Illinois. This podcast and everything found on the website is covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more at BIPCOT.org. So let me start by saying that I'm mind-blown about how great the reception has been to our last few episodes on the philosophic corruption of reality, uh, or physics, and the electric universe theory. And I'll be honest, those three episodes really did kind of take me out of my comfort zone, uh, but I, I appreciate that. And uh, I do think that's, you know, one, one of the best ways to, to grow intellectually is to explore subjects uh, that are outside of your comfort zone. So uh, it seems like the listeners agreed, which was actually, which is really, really incredible to see. Got some good feedback on uh, from, from a patron. And we, us- we uh, even got another Patreon uh, patron uh, for an additional $10 a month. So I'd like to go ahead and thank Crystal uh, for that contribution. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're overjoyed that uh, you, you found uh, enough value in, uh, you know, those series of episodes that uh, you've you know, became a uh, patron. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, and it does really open up a whole new realm of investigation uh, for us here at Liberty Under Attack Radio. So we, you know, it's certainly exciting. It really is. Uh, obviously, the, the normal episodes on direct action are absolutely important, but there are there are other kind of uh, avenues of human experience that uh, do deserve some investigation. So uh, that said, uh, we're going to radically shift gears today, uh, you know, back to back to my comfort zone. Uh, I guess you could say. So I'm pleased to welcome back Kyle Reardon uh, to the podcast. Uh, you can find his work at thelastbastille.com. So uh, welcome back to the show, man. Uh, how's it going? Not too bad. Not too bad yourself. Oh, doing doing uh, quite well. Cannot uh, cannot complain. So Kyle, the last time we had you on uh, was when we discussed uh, Rayo's article uh, titled titled uh, Ethical Land Use, uh, which was a follow-up episode to our conversation on Fee Simple versus Elodial Title. Uh, and I would definitely recommend the listeners uh, check those episodes out, uh, libertyunderattack.com. Uh, but uh, Kyle, what else have you been uh, working on lately, man? Well, as of lately, I've been trying to survive the uh, the servile society, which, of course, is the Venuan term for the mainstream uh, authoritarians who try to use coercion against their fellow man. And I mean, at this point, I'm just trying to become as invulnerable to coercion as possible. Uh, in whatever ways I can. So yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes trying to be a little bit, uh, 
sly when I'm at work in the sense of not completely telling everybody the truth about how I really think about things has actually kept me uh, safer uh, more so than not at least at least so far. And then of course there's always you know pursuing some flavor of financial independence and being very frugal and try to maybe at some point take some of my savings and actually put it in an investment vehicle so I can make uh, the ferns, the Federal Reserve notes you know work for me instead of me working for them. Uh, but besides that, I mean, at some point, I'll, I'll try and get my third book done about uh, lawfare, uh, basically the government's use of its own laws as a weapon of war against the citizenry. So I, I've got a lot of different things kind of going on, so to speak. So I'm I'm never bored, I'll say that, except, of course, when I'm at work. Right, right. And we've also been doing uh, the Vani podcast uh, since January of uh, this year. And uh, that this uh, this episode of uh, LUA Radio today will be a, a part two of that for uh, for listeners to the Vani podcast. I'd like to welcome those new folks that may be here. But uh, but yeah, man, it's uh, vani has been fun. vani has been fun, and uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of uh, great feedback on that podcast as well. Well, I'm definitely glad to hear it. And you know, for those folks who are already predisposed towards. Uh, direct action and just you know doing whatever they can to make themselves freer you know liberty within their lifetimes so to speak uh, I, I think Vanu is a particularly good uh, version or flavor of direct action which uh, which has its its more focus on invulnerability to coercion and so kind of exploring like how can that be done in early 21st century America is, is a question worth exploring but yeah suffice it to answer your question that that's kind of what I've been up to more or less uh, never a dull moment that's for sure right right so uh, uh, so I guess let's let's go ahead and get get into it here we've got uh... A lot on our we got a, we've, we've definitely got a lot to uh, to cover, such as uh, vigilantism, uh, Jim Bell's proposal of assassination politics, uh, and avenging angels, which is a retaliatory concept presented by Rayo in his book Vanu: The Search for Personal Freedom, which you can get for free by by visiting bonniepodcast.com and uh, just finding the free books tab there at the top. You'll find uh, that book. You'll find Rayo's second book, Vanu Book Two. And then uh, I also have to get that tab updated with uh, all of the new libertarian publications that we've been digitizing through Liberty Under Attack uh, publications. So certainly a lot of free reading material for you. And uh, as always, if you enjoy the, uh, if you appreciate the effort put into it and value the content, uh, we always uh, appreciate your support. Uh, I guess uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, unless, uh, do you have anything else before we, uh, before we really dig into it? I, I, I just would like to remind everyone that... In a couple years when there's the so-called re-election, please, for goodness sakes, don't really pay that much attention to it. Instead, uh, really look at that freedom umbrella of direct action and, well, you don't even have to wait until the re-election several years from now. You can start doing stuff on that freedom umbrella right now. <laughs> so that's really the only other thing I'd like to add at this point. Right. You mean the re-selection, uh, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but you know, I, I do think this episode will be, you know, it, it can be highly valuable to anarchists. And for those who are, you know, very deeply interested in Ben Stone's work, especially his book, uh, Seditions, Versions, Sabotage, I think you'll find some interesting concepts. And Kyle and I have been talking about doing an episode on this, and I guess the stars finally aligned, uh, you know, to, to where we're able to do this. But uh, we've been talking about it for a while, and I've been really excited about it because there are a couple of really – Interesting avenues, uh, you know, this could this could go down, uh, and uh, you know, I th I really do think uh, this will be a, a very valuable uh, episode. So, we're gonna start with vigilantism. Uh, so, so when we were talking about this, Kyle, you figured it'd probably be a good idea to talk about the non-aggression principle first. Well, yes, and there are many voluntarists and propertarians of all various flavors, people who care about private property or at least profess as much. And, uh, you know, when it comes to trying to seize the moral high ground, so to speak, they like to talk about the NAP, the non-aggression principle, quite a lot. And one of the interesting tasks in philosophy is to really take first principles of whatever kind and see how far you can stretch them without actually breaking them. Uh, to, you know, to what degree can they be logically applied without uh, without basically contradicting, uh, without being contradictory, essentially. So I, I I think we've we've mentioned at least argumentation ethics before. I think there was that argumentation ethics anthology that was published, I believe. Right, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash let us argue. Yep. Yeah, and that 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 covered pretty much like what was it, twenty some odd years worth of different uh, articles from various libertarian publications by many different people, uh, basically trying to examine 
Hans Hermann Hoppe's original proposal of argumentation ethics. And yeah, so, and, ho and hopefully Hoppe's name doesn't trigger some of you guys because he's got, he's become quite contentious in libertarian and anarchist circles now. But go ahead. <laughs> oh my gosh, the the lefties getting triggered. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's it's it just kind of gets silly all of a sudden. It's like, yeah, can't can I just agree with one guy about his one idea and kind of disregard some of the other ideas he has, which of course are all biased. I mean, come on, we're adults here. This isn't supposed to be an all or nothing thing. But in any case, yeah, I mean, basically Hans Hermann Hoppe's idea of argumentation ethics was essentially is that it's a logical proof that demonstrates the performative contradictions within all political arguments except those justifying private property. So it validates the non-aggression principle as well as the self-ownership axiom by showing that individuals who argue with each other have not only forsworn coercion, but even in the very moment of arguing, they have affirmed property rights in that very moment. And so when it comes to the non-aggression principle, the reason why that's important is that it's basically a way of trying to, how to, uh, of trying to understand use of force issues. Under what circumstances can physical force be applied by one human against another without actually violating anyone's liberties or rights or what have you, exactly. especially, especially private property rights. That's, that's kind of the issue. So what argumentation ethics tells us is that, well, whatever it all is, especially in the context of people arguing with each other, it has to be consistent and has to have integrity. And oh, by the way, it's all based on private property anyway, right? Because that's how people actually argue. Collectives don't argue with each other. Individuals argue with each other and so forth. So the, the point here to make is that it's important to keep in mind that most people aren't logical and are more than fine with, pro with private property rights violations. So when use of force issues comes up, um, the common emotional reaction is that, at least from people within the servile society, Shane, is that they get very riled up and very defensive, but not in a martial arts sense. They get very defensive emotionally because now they're starting to kind of feel that maybe they're just hypocritical. <laughs> right, right, and and then they, uh, <laughs> and then you know, speaking of contradictions, uh, you know, they're they're fearful of that of that uh, so-called violence, and therefore they. Go and uh, you know beg the uh, the most violent monopoly ever to exist in the history of, uh, of, of in, in, the, in human history. Uh, they go beg them to to try to protect them. So uh, certainly contradictions, uh, uh, certainly plenty of contradictions uh, to discuss there. But uh, so vigilantism. Uh, so uh, that would uh, you know the the nap would definitely come into play with vigilantism determining. Uh, uh, well, I guess first off, let's let's define it. Uh, what is vigilantism? Well, according to Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, there's a source, right? According to Wikipedia, a vigilante is defined as a civilian or organization acting in a law enforcement capacity or in the pursuit of self-perceived justice without legal authority. Uh, that's a little bit of a kind of a convoluted way of putting it, I suppose. So to maybe try and get another definition of vigilantism, I guess you could also view it as, um, what was that old moniker that, that's kind of uh, derogatory about people taking justice into their own hands, so yes, to speak? Yes, yes. And, and, and all I'm thinking is like, okay, so what did people do before the state? Or even before monopolized policing in America, uh, you know, speaking of Roger Roots' Our Cops Constitutional, it was the prerogative of the citizen. Uh, you know, I think the, the only the only constitutional position, you know, like I guess with when it comes to, to cops is, is the sheriff. And, uh, you know, you know, when this country was, you know, so-called founded, uh, it was, you know, the prerogative of the citizen to make citizens arrest. And if they saw people violating person or property, they they were the ones that, uh, you know, that, that would, uh, you know, do do most of that. And then they would turn them over to the sheriff. Right. And in Dr. Roger Roots' seminal paper, Are Cops Constitutional, um, yeah, the for the first, what was it, 70, 80, 90 years of this country or thereabouts, a significant portion over half a century at least, uh, there was no such thing as professional so-called law enforcement in this country. So how does that work exactly? I guess you could somewhat, I guess maybe – Maybe conceptually, kind of consider that vigilantism, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't specifically because that was their that was their their job, right? Um, so it was citizens pursuing the ends of justice. Yeah, I, I guess that would definitely be one way of putting it. And to kind of refer to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, 
A vigilante is defined as a member of a volunteer committee organized to suppress and punish crime summarily, as when the processes of law are viewed as inadequate. Uh, more broadly defined, it is a self-appointed doer of justice. So that's interesting. So there is very much the, uh, the concepts of justice and punishment at play here regarding what a vigilante actually is conceptually, that you can't get away from dealing with uh, justice and punishment. And as many uh, libertarian philosophers would put it, uh, or at least some would, uh, libertarian theory does come down to what some people call punishment theory. Under what conditions would a human being be uh, liable or responsible or culpable uh, in being punished for their actions? Yeah, and then that, in a lot of ways, that would kind of also determine the extent of the non-aggression of principle, uh, non-aggression principles applicability to humans as well. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Now, one thing I've noticed, Kyle, uh, especially when it comes to the uh, the the uninformed, uh, you know, uh, general populace, uh, they, they tend to uh, equate vigilantism to some very strange things. Uh, you know, specifically uh, things like uh, you know guerrilla warfare, revolutions, vendettas, gun ownership, uh, war, assassination, and militia. So let's go ahead and you know, I guess go ahead and dispel those uh, those those uh, those false uh, uh, equivalencies there. Uh, so how does how is vigilantism different from guerrilla warfare? Okay, well, guerrilla warfare really is, and I've written about this many times on my blog, uh, various book reports, and other articles, and just other things. Um, guerrilla warfare really is a type or a class of strategy and tactics that really revolve around basically conducting war on a shoestring budget, on essentially using your uh, using your enemy's uh, weaknesses as your strengths, right? So if you're the gorilla, to use a kind of a broader example, if you're the gorilla, uh, you're going to be, you know, pro possibly impoverished, but at the very least, you're going to be small and quick. Whereas your more intimidating foes are going to be large and slow, even if they are wealthier. So basically, if you say pilfer the enemy's uh, weapon stockades, you know, though they grow weaker as you grow stronger. And that, that's kind of a, I guess, a more vernacular way of trying to describe uh, guerrilla warfare. Yeah, and, and, and vigilantism, I, I mean, sure, uh, and we'll get, we'll get more deeply into this as we move forward, but uh, sure, you know, a group of vigilantes could go after, you know, the mafia or something along those lines, but uh, there's also vigilantes that, uh, you know, will just take on, you know, singular, uh, you know, rapists, thieves, and criminals. So obviously, you know, one-on-one -on -one is not guerrilla warfare, so there's definitely differences between the two, uh, and, I, I, and obviously, you know, vigilantes may be, you know, attacking an enemy, uh, and, uh, and, and guerrilla war, people, or I guess guerrillas could be, you know, trying to achieve, you know, their, their ends of justice. Uh, but there definitely are some significant differences between the two. Yeah. Yeah. And regarding that, that other one too, because in, in many ways, uh, revolutionaries have often been confused with guerrillas and sometimes they are really the same sometimes, but there is, but they can also at times be mutually exclusive. Uh, revolutions and, of course, revolutionaries, the individuals who conduct revolutions, are really more about violently overthrowing an established government and replacing it with their own. That's, that's, that's kind of the thing. So even the concept of a so-called anarchist revolutionary is really kind of problematic right from the get-go. Because the whole point of, the, of a revolution, much like in the scientific, dare shall I say, uh, really physics term is really about revolving you know beginning yeah, it's, again it's, circu it's, it's circular yeah it has to be right because that's what the word actually means Re course, you know, revolution yeah. re revolve you know revolving again again this is not the same as an as an evolution which is which is going in pretty much in some people would assume a linear direction uh but revolutions are circular they have to be and so yes if you presume that through tyrannicide done in a systematic way, in a very collective movementist sort of way, whether in various places like Cuba or France or different places, times and places in history. Uh, yeah, so if you want to basically, you know, shack up with the Jacobins and the communists, uh, good for you, I guess. Just don't be surprised when they betray you. Uh, look at the Russian anarchists during the October Revolution. 
Uh, they were betrayed by the Bolsheviks, who were communists and so forth. So no, I'm not really big on revolutions because they tend to have a really terrible history, which, by the way, would be a wonderful uh, uh, topic for, for a completely different episode because there's a lot of details revolving out, lots of different case studies regarding revolutions. Um, but to comparing it to the previous term, you know, not all guerrilla warfares are revolutions and not all revolutions are guerrilla warfare. You know, there are revolutions where basically there is virtually no guerrilla warfare at all. And of course, there's guerrilla warfare where the guerrillas are not revolutionaries at all. They're just simply uh, trying to uh, essentially defend themselves from insurgents or other criminal types or even governments. But it's not in the context of let's overthrow the government. It's more in the context of the government's committing democide. We have to defend ourselves from the democidal government. So it's not we want to take them over. It's we just don't want to be murdered. There is a difference. Right. Right. So so the next one here, vendettas. So so vendettas, I, I, I guess uh, I don't have a definition up in front of me, but it would be, you know, revenge. Right. Uh, so so uh, someone does something to you or, or someone you love and uh, you want to take revenge upon that person. Now, I imagine, I, I, I'm sure there are scenarios where uh, vigilantes could be pursuing the pursuing vendettas, right? If they're taking the law into their own hands uh, and, you know, trying, you know, uh, getting the justice that they, that they think uh, is deserved, uh, then they would be, uh, I, I think they would be considered vigilantes, wouldn't they? So how, how would these two things be distinguished? I would say that there, in some circumstances, vigilant, vigilantes and, or excuse me, vigilantism and vendettas could be overlapped in some circumstances. But I would also suggest that much like the difference between guerrilla warfare and revolutions, vigilantism and vendettas can also be mutually exclusive. Because remember, there are vigilantes who are vigilantes who don't have any vendettas, and then there are people who engage in vendettas who would never be described as vigilantes, because remember the definition of vigilantes has something to do with punishment and, more importantly, has something to do with justice. And if the people conducting vendettas are not concerned with the justice, then you right. can't really call them vigilantes. This is an issue of logic. If the people, I'll say this again, if the people involved in a vendetta, in conducting a vendetta, are not concerned with justice, they cannot be called vigilantes, even if the press wants to call them that, okay? Vendettas, if we are to have at least a looser definition, one definition basically points out that vendettas uh, involve a blood feud between families where there's a murdered person and thus they want to go murder an individual of the other family, which is a more an older definition of the term. Uh, probably a more modern contemporary definition would be like a prolonged bitter quarrel uh, between individuals. So if you look at like the practice of dueling, which used to be legal. Oh, it still should uh, be legal, <laughs> as far as I'm be concerned. Because, because it is the least violent way of actually settling conflicts, isn't it, right? So when the individuals in question, I mean, this is a little bit of a different topic, but just to kind of, as a side note, yeah, dueling is actually less violent than, say, war. If right. you had to make so, a choice. So, 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 so if Dolan, Dolan J. Tramp uh, wanted to, you know, uh, dueled uh, Kim Jong Un, you know, there could be a lot of uh, innocent lives saved from, uh, you know, a nuclear war, you know, hypothetically, if that were to come into fruition. So, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> sure. And I think a lot of us also would also, uh, if there was like some sort of, whether it took the context of a boxing match or even an MMA cage fight or whatever else, I think a lot of us would uh, make some handsome profits if we were uh, gambling on uh, who would win in a fight, right? Um, so, so whether you whether whether it's the profit making potential of a vendetta, or excuse me, of a duel, whether it's the profit making potential of a duel, uh, and or the much less bloody, much less property destruction, much less property of life that a duel entails relative to a war, then yeah, I, dueling should be legal. That's not. That shouldn't even be an issue, but of course we're ruled over by authoritarians who like war, but say that dueling is illegal because you citizens can't be trusted to manage your own affairs, which of course doesn't make any sense, but that's authoritarians for you. But yeah, but uh, regarding vendettas, that that's what they are. Uh, it's 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 quarreling with people, and it's quarreling with people to the extent where you can't resolve your differences, your conflicts peaceably in the sense of like verbally. And we're basically you're looking at fisticuffs, at least. 
Right, right. So, so, so the next one, I, you know, I, with all with the stuff happening in the, in the uh, news cycle now, we're not going to go into that here. We don't do that here on Liberty Under Attack Radio. But uh, you know, gun ownership has been uh, kind of a very hotly debated topic, as it tends as it tends to be. You know, once uh, once the news cycle starts talking about a, about uh, any sort of scenario, it seems. But uh, I would say that some leftists would consider gun owners vigilantes. Uh, so, so how, I guess l let's talk about that for a little bit here. Well, first of all, gun ownership is one type of private property ownership, first and foremost. So whether it's a rifle, a pistol, a, um, you know, a revolver, a shotgun, whatever we type of weapon, firearm. We're weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> whatever. It well, that's going well, that's going outside the scope of firearms. But sure, you know, I mean, uh, the laws say arms, the people, right, the people to keep and bear arms. Uh, so, yeah, arms could also be extended to howitzers and tanks and whatever else. Um, but even if we were limited to our, ourselves to firearms, that's still, you know, private property ownership first and foremost. So any type of taxation, regulation, or even at the extreme confiscation would, of course, be a gross violation of property rights. Any of them would be. And at that point, it's just, you know, to, you know how heinous is the gross violation of property rights, because arguably uh, firearms regulation is not as severe as outright confiscation, although some people would probably argue the other way around uh, for other reasons, such as we can get a revolution going if the lefties would just grab the guns, and then they're going off into political theory and hypotheticals, which may or may not have anything to do with reality. But regarding the key issue here about our gun owners vigilantes, it is true that many, not all, gun owners are concerned with issues of justice. That is true because many of them are gun owners because they are not so much concerned with hunting or sportsmanship, but rather they are more concerned with issues of self-defense. So justice and even punishment, at least to some degree, is on their minds, especially with a lot of women who are armed, many with revolvers, although not always, uh, for reasons of self-defense, and again, because many, not all, but many are concerned about not being raped. That is the kind of their goal, okay? So this is not a little issue, and you would think feminists, mainstream feminism, would be very much in favor of gun ownership by women as a deterrent, and yes, as a defensive measure against rape, but no, they don't do that because that would be too quote-unquote right-wing. Nope, so you just, can kind just, of see just urinate. That'll 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 deter the rapist, apparently. Or or crying for help, or dialing nine one one, or lying there and take it, or any one of these so called strat. I mean, heck, even if the leftists were encouraging martial arts for women, even I would say that's a much better approach rather than any of this silly other stuff, which basically turns the victim, uh, the woman into a victim, which I thought feminism was supposed to be against all of that. We're about empowering women. Well, if you want to empower a woman, make sure she has access to guns, you idiot. That's what the pioneer women of the 19th century had access to. Now, those pioneer women were truly empowered women, especially when their husbands, when they were, uh, had to go out, uh, you know, to town to trade for supplies or whatever, because remember, Remember, there weren't gas stations all around the place uh, or grocery stores, so they had to travel like a couple days out to get anywhere to go buy stuff. Uh, a lot of times, Mama was at home with the kids, and if there was a bear or some other kind of predator, human or animal, a lot of times she had to grab the rifle that a lot of times was hung over the hearth in a very much, you know, little house on the prairie, Laura Ingalls Wilder style, and go deal with the threat herself. Now, fem mainstream feminism doesn't talk about that because, of course, it would destroy their uh, affectations for socialism, doesn't it? Which is all about promoting the welfare state because that's what's what it's really about. It's not really about women or their liberties or even opposing nasty authoritarian measures like coverture laws. What it's really about is using women as a tool to promote socialism. That's what it's really about. And that's why they demonize gun ownership. And they will never, ever promote gun ownership as a way to deter and repel rapists, ever. So, of course, leftists and other authoritarians, even many conservatives, and under certain circumstances, especially the neocons, will demonize gun ownership and gun owners themselves as vigilantes. When all, you wanted to, when all the gun owners want to do is not become victims. 
because, of course, they're hypocrites and also irrational fools. That's pretty much what's going on there. Okay, very, very good, very good. And, and uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure the listeners of LUA missed, uh, missed those, missed those rants. I know, I know, I did over here. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, love it, love it. Uh, so, so the next one here. Uh, so, how, how is war distinguished from vigilantism? I think this one kind of goes without saying, but uh, you know, apparently not. Well, war is different from vigilantism because let's say let's say anarchists got everything they wanted and let's say the state was abolished next month. Well, uh, let's see, chances are you wouldn't have war, at least not on the, not on the broad scale or the normal concept of war as you would think about it. Uh, but there would still be crime. There would still be criminals. And many of them wouldn't be empowered by the excesses of the state, by statism itself and so forth. But come on, you're going to have muggings and robberies and carjackings and such, at, le at least here and there, depending on certain areas, right? Uh, private criminals have their own motives and so forth. So uh, there will pretty much always be a market demand for vigilantism, always. And even when the vigilante says, not, you know, knock some skulls together— how does that even begin to compare to war? Yeah. How does well, uh, if you look at government war, there's no. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's no pursuit of justice. Uh, justice is, uh, you know, uh, sacrificing 500,000 children uh, from sanctions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, to to uh, further to f to further uh, you know Western ends. So, so yeah, there, there's no there's no pursuit of justice there, uh, or anything of that nature, uh, or punishment. So. So yeah, certainly not even close to vigilantism. I'm not sure how this uh, how this is even equated to it. Right, and to, and to use a really old historical example, you know what wars are really like. If we're going to compare the ancient with the with the modern, what it really is is kind of like the ancient Mayan Empire. In uh, I think there were different terms for it. I think one of them was called War of the Roses, not to be confused with the English War of the Roses. That was something different regarding the English monarchy, but uh, the War of the Roses where the Mayans made a point to not kill their enemies, uh, such as the various enemy tribes, so-called of one kind or another, but instead would kidnap them, capture them alive, and lead them back to you know their, their cities to where they would be sacrificed, ritualistically murdered, in order to make sure basically that the crops would grow. Because that's what war actually is like, even in the modern era. Yeah, it's, it's basically sacrificing humans to the state, yeah. Oh, it's no, ritualistic sacrifice, sacrificing animals to the state because, of course, we have to ritualistically – we, we, the collective we, have to sacrifice our fellow humans in order to spread democracy around the world because that's what Woodrow Wilson and other uh, bureaucrats and tyrants have said. Right, I mean, uh, because we have to stop uh, Islamic fundamentalism. We, we have to do this. We have to ritualistically sacrifice humans, murder them, because if not, the crops won't grow, because ISIS will take over North America, because the communists will take over Vietnam and then come to America, as was the case that was argued by the authoritarians back in the 1960s. Okay, here's my point. They lie, they lie. They lie. That's what war is. War is a lie. And what's and actually real. Right. And what's actually real is the violence. What's actually real is putting bullets in people's heads, like the communists have done, but others as well. Um, you know, American troops frequently use napalm against the Vietnamese. Uh, civilians, not just the Viet Cong communists. Um, that's what's real is the actual violence at play. So what's the difference between vigilantism and war? Well, geez, gee, holly willikers, Batman. Uh, the violence, both the degree of it and the scope of it, and also the types of it, tend to be nowhere as severe. I mean, vigilantism is a drop in the bucket. I mean, what, what are we talking about? Maybe killing a few people, maybe breaking a few bones, at most, maybe— versus war, like the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or lesser well-known, firebombing Dresden, Germany during the World War II, which was actually inhabited by civilians. I don't think that even comes close. No, no, not even close. Not even close at all. Uh, so, so these these last two. Uh, so assassination. Now, I, I do imagine, I, 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 would, I would think that there would be some scenarios in when, uh, wherein 
vigilantes would carry out assassinations. Uh, so I guess they're like with with um, with vendettas. I think there's an, an overlap in some areas, but uh, but generally, what do you think? Uh, are are assassination attempts or assassinations, uh, you know, categories of vigilantism? I think on this one, they're, they're both, they, in some circumstances, they're mutually exclusive, and in other ones, they do overlap. Vigilantes can be assassins. Assassins can be vigilantes. But also, there are uh, vigilantes who will never kill, who will never assassinate. And there are assassins who don't give one lick about justice, such as the assassins who work for the Central Intelligence Agency. All right? So, yeah, there, there, there is a difference. Assassination more is a form of what some people would consider to be a form of premeditated murder. Um, other people would, would describe it as extrajudicial killing, um, where the victim doesn't even have a chance to fight back. So it's not like a duel in that sense, where at least the per person who dies at least went down fighting. Assassination doesn't work like that. It's like stabbing somebody in, in their sleep kind of thing. It's very, uh, assassinations are very one-sided, always have been. And that's that's kind of the nature of the beast, so to speak. Uh, with, vigilant, with vigilantism, uh, you know, if your vigilante takes on somebody, I mean, maybe they'll sneak up on them and maybe there's a chance to fight back or, or maybe not. I mean, that kind of depends. And of course, not all vigilantes kill. Uh, assassins, by definition, kill their victims. They have to. I mean, that's what assassination is, assassinations are, right? If the assassin um, attacks their victims, but the victims are alive, then the assassin's not a very good assassin now, is he? <laughs> no. No, no, he is not. No, he is not. So mov moving forward here, uh, so militias, uh, obviously, oh man, does the left love to, to demonize, uh, d demonize militias? Uh, so I, I guess, uh, can militias be, uh, you know, vig vigilantes, uh, or, uh, or is this another case where, uh, you know, they're, they're not even close? Well, militia broadly defined could be considered like a military, a type of military force that is, uh, recruited or formed or raised up from the civilian population to supplement, uh, a standing army, especially during an emergency, uh, militia could also be conceived of as a type of military force that is used for so-called national security purposes in place of a standing army. So instead of having a standing army, you just have militia, right? That was the original American idea, by the way, was that the founders were very rightly suspicious of standing armies, which had always been the products of empire. And in order to have their republic, uh, they figured a militia system was much better since the militia system was already well operating in the colonies for at least hundred some odd years pr pr uh, prior to when uh, the Revolutionary War for Independence and so forth. Um, I could it could also be said that militia, even more broadly defined, could be considered all able-bodied civilians that are eligible by law for for military service. Which, of course, is so broad, that could basically be easily anywhere between a, th uh, a quarter to a third of the population or even more, depending on, uh, uh, depending on you know, uh, quality of life and health and so forth. So that's, that's kind of very interesting, right? In many ways, it could be considered that, you know, some people have kind of said tongue-in-cheek, that militia is nearly everybody. Um, because the concept can, is, is so... Let me put it this way. Militia is a very populist idea. That I can say with certainty. Militia is populist because it's not about uh, the so-called experts. It's not about uh, career officers, especially commission officers in the military. It's, it's basically more about like the people in common trained in the use of arms is really kind of what a militia really is at its, at its core. So how does this differ from, vigil from vigilantes? Well, vigilantes at least conceptually, can be uh, sole operators. They can work by themselves. Militia, by contrast, is a collective. It is a type of group. Um, obviously, a member of a militia would be known as a militia man. It was, was kind of the, the grammatical way of describing that. But generally speaking, if you just have a militia man and he's in the middle of the woods, then you kind of have to ask, where is his militia? By contrast, if you have another man standing next to the militia man, but he's a vigilante, you don't even have to ask, well, where is his, you know, uh, you know, Justice League of America? I mean, that doesn't make any sense, right? 
You don't even need to make the comic book allusions. It's just, oh, there's the vigilante. There's, you know, blah 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 right, standing right there. He doesn't need, a vigilante doesn't need a group. So I think militias conceptually very much is a collectivist concept. I'll, I'll be a populist one. Uh, whereas vigilantes more often than not tend to be more of an individualistic type of concept where really it's just like one guy or woman to be politically correct uh, who basically go around and dish out uh, what they perceive to be justice. Yeah, yeah. So and I'll get to this, uh, you know, just a, a little later on. There's some other preliminary stuff that uh, we need to get into. But uh, in Ben Stone's book, Seditions, Aversion, and Sabotage, he, he uh, I guess, uh, comes, up with this, comes up with this idea, Committees of Vigilance. Uh, so I guess, or I guess even with, uh, with the superhero thing, uh, what is it, the, the justice? I'm, I'm not a big, I'm not a big, you know, comic guy or, or, uh, uh, or I guess a superhero fan, uh, but like, wouldn't like the Justice League be, uh, it would be kind of a committee of vigilance, at least in some regard. Uh, couldn't that be considered a, a militia, at least to, to some degree? It would not be considered a militia because they're not populist. And remember, militias tend to be more geographically centered in their own locales and all that. Remember, the JLA in, in the fictional comics are very specialized individuals who are drawn from many different places, and they're not geographically centered much of anywhere uh, for enough, the most yeah. part. So um, I would say this. They're more similar to like a vigilance committee, which we'll get to here shortly. They're more similar to that than they would be a militia. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't know, man. I mean, bef I mean, I know we're about to transition into the, the comic book stuff. I, I will say this. Something like the JLA really is just more the modern incarnation of like Mount Olympus and the Olympian gods. I mean, that's that's really what that's about. It's not about you know, normal people trained in the use of arms and or have some sort of experience with use of force actually taking out crime bosses. That's not the Fair same enough. thing. Okay. That's not the same thing at all. Okay. Very good. I just figured I'd toss that question out there. I, I know I was curious, uh, so I figured some of the listeners might be too. And and since we're on the subject of, uh, you know, of superheroes, uh, I guess uh, comic books have a, a very big role in vigilantism. So uh, let's let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, can you provide you know a, a short history of comic books and how this is uh, relevant to vigilantism? Sure. Now keep in mind, a history of comic books would easily be its own episode uh, for its own reasons, just because there's a lot of detail. But that's why it's the short history, at least for purposes of tonight. Now there is a wonderful book by Scott McCloud called "Understanding Comics: The Invisible Art," and this is literally more along the lines of like a so-called graphic novel, but in essence, it's a comic book that's about 200 pages long. And it's really just an exploration more of a new type of art theory. Now, look, I studied art history when I was in college. So this is actually something I'm, a, I'm somewhat already familiar with. But I loved McLeod's description because he's actually a cartoonist or, or a comic book artist or something to that effect. So he's actually someone in the business who actually uh, wrote and drew uh, this book to really uh, kind of explain how comic books work. And so this book, Understanding Comics, the Invisible Art, is fantastic because it's very uh, – I guess you could say it is metafictional at least in some sense um, because he's using the medium of – the comic book form to actually describe how comic books work. I mean, it's really kind of brilliant if you think about it. It would be like, for example, a novelist trying to write something like a novel in order to explain how novels are work and how they're put together and so forth. Right, and let me jump in here real quick. Um, as far as that book, uh, I'm working on, this will be the third time I'll try to set up an Amazon affiliate account. For some reason, they continue to shut them down. For They, they give me they give me reasons each time, so I fix those, and there seems to be always some sort of issue. Uh, so hopefully, you know, by the time this episode airs, I'll have all that ironed out. And I will have in the show notes, uh, you know, a, a place where you can buy that book uh, if you're interested from Amazon. And, uh, you know, uh, that'll help us out and give us a little kickback. Uh, so I just wanted to toss that out there. Kyle, uh, go ahead. So in terms of McLeod's attempt to put a definition together for what are comics, not comic books, but comics more generally. Uh, I think the definition he eventually kind of had to kind of develop, really, is that he said comics are defined as juxtaposed pictorial 
and other images in deliberate sequence. Juxtapose pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. Most of the book is really about how comic books work. It's about uh, different artistic styles that are more abstract, uh, that, that, excuse me, go along a range of more abstract artistic styles to ones that are more realistic and concrete. Um, things that relate to how do you depict action, uh, differences between uh, what some would consider anime, really Japanese uh, styles versus the so-called Western styles. And, and because remember the Japanese, uh, a lot of their stuff developed in isolation up until recent decades. Uh, so they had very different ways of doing that. Um, there's also some older history in here, which even McLeod says needs kind of further clarification in future books, if anybody can really get, get around to doing it, where the oldest forms of language were actually in the form of pictures. And over time, Americans. and over time, right. And he mentioned, and McLeod mentioned hieroglyphics too. So, and over time with various, the evolution of human languages basically went from picture, 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 and then the pictures became more like letters. And then the letters became more ab less concrete, more abstract. And then eventually you have letters like the Phoenician alphabet. Actually, the development of alphabets in general were just uh, systematic uh, pictures that represented certain uh, phonetic sounds. So he really kind of goes through all of it because then he mentions about how comics are unique as a medium where they are a combination of both pictures and words, right? The whole word balloon thing. So what I'm trying to get at is this, ladies and gentlemen. McLeod spends most of this 200-page book describing basically the, 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 the closest and real, most real explanation of art theory about comics that I've ever seen. I mean, this is like, this is really like, you know, um, going behind the curtain, so to speak. And he lays it out beautifully. And only until the child, the, like one of the last chapters, w this particular one was about color. Does he mention that at one point, especially I think it was during the 50s or thereabouts, the reason why there was the so-called superheroes uh, was because uh, newspaper uh, companies and, and such wanted to kind of capitalize on the new technology of like uh, of, of like the bright color spectrums which were not available before and that's kind of all that was happening there um, and so that that was pretty much it that was the only reason why you had the goddish uh, costumes and so forth and the superpowers and all of that it was a way of trying to accentuate the medium of comics as as, an, as truly an art form uh, but try to catch it more in in the in the <laughs> the, the common uh, man's uh, and getting it away from more the notion of like fine art and more the notion of like popular or like mainstream art and so forth. So that was really it. It was it was really more of a coincidence than really anything else. Now here's what's interesting, and this is not mentioned in McLeod's book, but I know this from other sources. Apparently, the original superhero storylines, and I'm talking more along the lines of not so much what you would think of as stereotypical vigilantes like a Batman, etc., like actual human beings, but they're like really highly trained, like special forces types or something. I'm talking really more like metahumans, like a Superman or the X-Men type thing, right? They're aliens, they're mutants, they're not human, really. Now, those storylines were interesting because those metahumans, their villains were actually, in the original uh, plot lines, were actually organized crime bosses like the Camorra, the Mafiosi, the Irish Mob, and others. Now, that was very interesting because those villains actually did exist in real life. And so what was interesting was that there were people at the time, usually people of a, well, I guess you could call working class background, who uh, would take some of their discretionary income and spend it on comic books, or at least for their kids or whatever. And uh, let's just say that at the time, the uh, government police were not so happy. There were certain instances of vigilantism. This is where everything comes full circle, ladies and gentlemen, at least in some sense. There were certain incidents of vigilantism uh, you know, uh, after World War II where uh, people were, were – uh, teenagers were actually – physically taking on, not very successfully, but they tried, taking on uh, mobsters. 
because, of course, they were emulating those superheroes. Unintended consequences, huh? <laughs> and that's why the creation of so-called supervillains came into play. Now, this is the really insidious part. The entire creation of supervillains was specifically done with the purpose of trying to disincentivize teenagers in the 1950s from from maybe dressing up, maybe not, but but otherwise disincentivizing them from physically taking on organized crime in such boroughs, like whether it be in the boroughs of New York City or, or elsewhere. That was the real reason. So the only reason oh. why you had the Lex Luthers and the Joker and you know, all, you know these these hallmark names. Um, I mean, even even many of Batman's Rogues Gallery, even many of them really are just plain humans, but they're they're super villains inexplicably. Even though Oswald Cobblepot, aka the Penguin, is just an organized crime boss himself, because see that that's actually that particular character is actually a hallback to the original comic book villains. By the way, that's why the Penguin is actually important. As a side note. Um, but like many of the other supervillains are like these these cosmic entities, or they're aliens like Brainiac, who is a villain of super a recurring villain of Superman's, for example. The supervillains who are metahumans or aliens or robots or basically not organized crime bosses uh, were kind of just they kind of dripped and drabbed kind of out of the plot lines and so forth. Because of course we can't be encouraging children, these teenagers, to actually use some of that, those hormones and all that other stuff they're going through adolescence, in order to actually, in a kind of almost beneficially nice way, do what the police should have done, in terms of uh, breaking up organized crime. Right, right, and and, and you're you're kind of already going into it, but uh, yeah, you're kind of already going into it, but uh, I think a brief history of vigilantism in America is. Uh, is, is is warranted. Uh, you, you kind of you kind of already started it, uh, but walk us through. So, so there's the the 1950s where uh, you know teenagers were going out trying to fight the mob. Then you had kind of the I guess maybe the the, the, the counter propaganda where they where they uh, you know brought in these uh, you know these uh, these these meta human sort of versions and not the crime bosses. So kind of walk us through the story from that point. Well, unfortunately, I can't walk it from that point because we're going to talk about vigilantes in America briefly. Um, there, we need to go back in time just, just a little bit. So like in colonial era America, there was something called the war of the regulation, AKA the regulator movement. Now this pre, this, this, uh, preceded the revolutionary war. It went from about 1765 to 1771. Remember 1775 was when, um, the battles of battles of Lexington and Concord happened, which kicked off the revolution, by the way. Um, the regulator movement was when normal citizens took up arms against colonial officials. Now that's rather significant. Imagine, if you will, in today's modern era, normal people getting guns and shooting cops. Okay? That was the equivalent of the regulator movement in the late 1760s. Okay? Wow. They were they – were, Sometimes killing, sometimes not, but they were using force against law enforcement, the Redcoats. That was what was happening during that War of the Regulation. There's also an entire Wikipedia page I encourage people to read up on called the War of the Regulation. But that that's pretty much um, – that's at least a colonial era example of it. Um, I guess the really short and sweet and simple way of putting it was that – uh, the regulator movement of the uh, colonial period was composed of citizen volunteers, usually from the frontier, not like the city people because they're soft and weak, which tends to be more of an anthropological phenomenon, but that's a discussion for another time. These were citizen volunteers from the frontier areas who opposed official misconduct, really corruption, and they dealt with it by extrajudicially punishing banditry and they also protected citizens from Indian attacks. So they had, they wore a lot of different hats and so forth. Um, but if we're really going to talk about vigilantism in America, maybe some of the best examples comes from actually the 19th century, in fact. So let's talk about the San Francisco Committee of Vigilance, which was formed in 1851. Now, obviously, this was done in the San, uh, the San Fran area. And it was a way of trying to oppose uh, organized crime, which at the time was referred uh, – there was something called the Sydney Ducks, 
which was a gang of uh, criminal immigrants. And this isn't just immigrants that were falsely labeled uh, criminals. These really were criminals, like murdering people and such. Um, and that, but that, that was the point. The Sydney Ducks were a real criminal gang, um, and they were just violating property rights and and so forth. So in 1851, the Committee of Vigilance uh, had a promulgation of a of a written doctrine declaring its aims. So I guess in some sense they were a real life version of the ju so called Justice League of America. <laughs> In some ways, um, they basically said that, um, you know, the government is essentially not going to maintain uh, peace and law and order. So we're going to, you know, our lives, our fortune, our fortunes and our sacred honor, kind of paraphrasing the Declaration of Independence a little bit. Uh, we're going to, uh, like they said, we are determined that no thief, burglar, incendiary or assassin shall escape punishment either by the quibbles of the law. Really, that's a reference to lawfare, by the way. Uh, the insecurity of prisons, the carelessness or corruption of the police, or a laxity of those who pretend to administer justice. And that was from their own statement. So um, at one point, the Committee of Vigilance in San Fran offered a $5,000 reward. And by the way, $5,000 in 1851 actually meant a lot 50 more. 50 grand or something. Well, that's a lot of money. However, mm -hmm. however that would be. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> Correct for inflation, folks. But yeah, 5, that, that was a ran that was a random guess. Yeah, don't. Yeah, that, I don't mm -hmm. know how much that would actually be. But so ahead. five thousand. So yeah, do, do the math on your own time, folks. But basically, in the eighteen fifties, five thousand dollars back then, uh, five thousand dollar reward for the capture of anyone found guilty of arson, because apparently that was an issue at the time. Um, let's see. There was also a later committee of vigilance in San Fran that was reorganized in eighteen fifty six. Um, and, and some other stuff happened, but yeah, um, now what was interesting at one point was that the committee's authority was bolstered by militia units that were in the city. So that's interesting too, because you asked me earlier about the difference between vigilantes no and, and militias. Hmm. Or, but, but again, they're still different though, but sometimes in certain circumstances, they can at least be used to mutually reinforce each other, right? Like a militia captain would not be a vigilante. But if he's noticing the vigilantes are actually doing something good, maybe the militia captain of, of like, militia A will order his uh, foot soldiers, so to speak, the militiamen to, you know, not, uh, you know, basically gun down the vigilante, so to speak. Especially right. if especially if the captain's superiors are corrupt, and he knows they're corrupt, but he doesn't want, but he's trying to kind of hold on to his post for whatever reason, right? I mean, there's a thousand and one things that can be kind of going on there. So San Francisco Committee of Vigilance, that's definitely uh, one example. Um, it's interesting too, throughout American history, there have been different groups of vigilantes who would take on bandit gangs that the government wouldn't, either couldn't or wouldn't take on. So, for example, um, in 1858, San Luis Obispo vigilantes ended the murderous reign of the bandit gang of Pio Linares on El Camino Real between San Luis and Santa Barbara. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, I mean, there's so many examples. Oh, here's another one. Uh, apparently, there was something called the Montana Vigilantes, which began in 1863, uh, which at that time was part of the Idaho Territory. Um, they followed the model of the previous San Francisco Committee of Vigilance. Um, they, they, they did a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> so, so suffice it to say, uh, American history is kind of littered with, uh, vigilantism, but of course this is supposed to be a brief overview and, and to go into more depth would, would, would simply require more time. Yeah, so 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 I guess one one point to bring up here is you know back in the 19th century, vigilantism probably wasn't demonized uh, like it is today. Uh, so so yeah, this is a brief history, and I want to jump forward. Cause I'm super excited to talk about uh, one of these this one of these newer phenomenons, uh, the real life superheroes. Uh, obviously today, uh, when you look at vigilantism, that is de that is demonized. And uh, the mainstream media, you know, and, and some of these uh, and some of these news reports, most of the time local uh, with some of these real life superheroes, uh, they don't demonize, but they just kind of point out how dangerous it is, how dangerous it is uh, as a form of deterrence uh, for, from people, you know, going out and, and, and getting into these dangerous encounters. Uh, but let's jump forward to, you know, the, the, the real life superheroes, unless there's anything else that you think is, is particularly, uh, you know, important to mention before that.
Yes, one thing in particular. The mainstream media will demonize vigilantes by basically saying that their, their so-called argument al runs along the lines of, well, the Ku Klux Klan were a group of vigilantes, and because they lynched uh, people of a, dar of a typically darker skin tone than, than themselves, uh, therefore all vigilantes are, are, are bigoted, prejudiced, racist, et cetera, et cetera, bad people in general, right? Uh, that that's kind of that's kind of how they argue it. Um, that's actually incorrect because remember the definition of a vigilante involves necessitates someone who is interested in punishment, uh, but more in the context of of justice. Um, if you have a gang of people who go and murder innocent people for whatever reason, you can't really call them vigilantes. They are criminals. They are gangs. So I guess what the mainstream media is kind of really playing fast and loose with, besides, of course, preying on the ignorance of their audiences, is that they are kind of making a false equivalency between vigilantes, properly understood, versus gang members. Now, gangs and gang members and organized crime are composed of criminals, right? Individuals who privately use coercion against their fellow human beings. That's kind of uh, the vanuist uh, conception of, of criminality and so forth in the, in the common sense, without, without getting into politics and statism and all of that. That's the common idea. Individuals use coercion against other individuals, basically. That, that's a criminal. Uh, vigilantes are not criminals by definition because they are concerned with justice, right? Criminals don't give a lick about justice. In fact, if criminals care about anything, it's about carrying out injustice by definition, right? So the false claim by the mainstream media that the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, is somehow composed of vigilantes doesn't make any sense because at best, the KKK is composed of criminals. Right, right, and I, th I think it is important to point out why, and, and this should be obvious to to uh, you know the audience of Liberty Under Attack, but uh, well, why why would the states uh, and uh, you know their their co cohorts in the in the media why would they demonize this? Well, obviously the state is competition; they have a, a monopoly on adjudication and uh, you know the the enforcement. They have the bludgies. Uh, that's why they they don't want competition, and uh, and uh, especially not. Uh, and I guess another argument from the media is that these, these people aren't trained. They don't have law enforcement training, and therefore they aren't. They can't do. They can't do the things that law enforcement does. Even though uh, it's it's been proven time and time again that uh, you know bludgies are very incompetent at their job. The only thing they're good at is beating down civilians and arresting people who have you know a gram of marijuana on them. Uh, but when it comes to actual real crimes. Uh, real, real uh, victims of property. Look at the clearance rates for murder, for rape, for for you know theft. Uh, you know that the clearance rates for those are super low. Uh, and uh, I think anyone, you know, any anyone with, with a rational mind wouldn't consider you know tossing someone in a cage for having a gram of marijuana would be justice. So that's why there's this 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 mass demonization about vigilantism. Uh, that that kind of is what it comes down to. Yeah, exactly. And to harken back to Dr. Roger Roots's Our Cops Constitutional, one of the many things he does touch in there are how incompetent the government police are. Um, I think one thing either he himself said or maybe it was a study by somebody else, uh, some of the effect of how uh, concealed carry permit holders are actually more accurate shots than the government police who frequently misfire or inaccurately aim – and you know, hit by you know, friendly fire is more common with police than carry permit holders and so forth. So, that's that's kind of the issue. There is also issues of competency. So every time the might as well be state-run media basically promotes the police and how wonderful the police are and blue lives matter and all of this propagandistic slogans and just authoritarian drivel. What it really kind of comes down to is that they're just sycophantic apologists for the establishment. That's really what it comes down to, right? Because especially when you look at – not to go on too, all, too on this other topic, but especially if you look in like the comprehensive annual financial reports, the CAFRs, you'll find that much of uh, these massive media corporations, whether it's the Big Five or other ones, even the local affiliates, are owned not always but frequently by government entities as uh, with, with large – as as major uh, majority shareholders and so forth. So there actually are very much invested, both figuratively and literally, uh, invest uh, vested interests 
uh, in mainstream media to make sure they toe the government line and say how wonderful the police are and they are here to serve and protect and blue lives matter and um, – you know, certain people that are upset who are murdered by police shouldn't be upset because it's just, well, that's just a few bad apples. We need to save the barrel. Instead, of course, the proper understanding of all this is which we need to throw the barrel out. But, of course, you can't ever go that far because that's radical. That's extreme. That's that's terrorism, maybe, uh, or, or, what, or whatever the version is. So about the real-life superheroes. I guess uh, the acronym, of course, is RLSH, but I'll just say the entire thing. The so-called real-life superheroes are basically people who in some ways are, whether intentionally or probably more likely than not unintentionally, they are essentially in a very wonderfully subversive way subverting the eventual – design of comic books as a as a purely entertainment distracting mechanism that kind of promotes this whole Olympian god complex. And they're instead kind of subverting that and trying to kind of encourage people to return v their attention more to vigilantism in like the real world. And they're using the popularity of comic books with superheroes to try and get back to actual real-world vigilantism, which I think is wonderfully subversive in a good sense. Oh, it's it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. I want to mention one, one guy here, and sorry if I'm, if I'm jumping in. I've, I've been waiting for this part, but a guy named Phoenix Jones. Uh, Kyle turned me on to him about, it was probably over a year ago at this point, and uh, I spent all evening watching, uh, the, he has a terrific YouTube channel, and he goes out there and he, he directly confronts uh, and and uh, in some some scenarios de-escalates, and in some scenarios he you know does what he needs to do and defends the uh, defends the the people that would eventually become victims. Uh, and uh, this guy uh, eventually that that night turned into uh, Phoenix Jones was a UFC fighter, mixed martial arts, and uh, <laughs> uh, so it ended up me watching his his, his uh, videos on his his fighting videos, and then uh, it kind of turned into three hours of watching uh, UFC, uh, completely divorced from the original topic of study. Uh, but anyways, the, the Phoenix Jones is a, a really incredible example, and and you look at the, it's it's surprising. Uh, like the the media attention he got when he was interviewed, he didn't like that. Obviously, the media was like, "Do you understand how dangerous a situation you walked into? You could have died." Uh, there was kind of that that sort of uh, you know kind of deterrence uh, deterrent attempt uh, at him. Um, but the the media attention he he, he garnered uh, from the stuff that he did, and uh, you just imagine you know like a five or six year old kid w watching local news and seeing Phoenix Jones in his you know superhero outfit talking about how he went and stopped a bad guy. Uh, you want to you want to talk about how much of an impact that would have seeing seeing you know the, this kid probably being you know interested in comic books and seeing that actually happen in real life? I think that's pretty incredible. Yes, yes, it is. Now I do want to kind of in, include a disclaimer here because where we're talking about this topic, generally speaking, I disagree with most, not all, but most of the tactics and strategies used by nearly all of the RLSH uh, folks. Uh, now, obviously, I guess you could say Phoenix Jones is kind of more the, the singular, iconic one because his so he's, story... He's, he's the exception, then. He's the most wonderful exception. He's the closest thing to Batman, actually. Um, the rest of them... I'm actually variously familiar with in one sense or another. Actually, I was thinking about contacting one of them because I was thinking about doing an interview and kind of a written interview and kind of uh, getting that on the blog. Unfortunately, the particular uh, guy kind of flaked out on that um, because I was really thinking about doing kind of an expose on it. You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of them are... It's... <sighs> It's like an odd combination, really, of like the, the like the type of people you would see at like the so-called Renaissance Fair, uh, Star Trek conventions, and probably some of the BDSM get-togethers. It's kind of just this this fandom type, you know, uh, hyper reality, make believe, role, li you know, live action role playing type thing, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, so to speak. And you know, that's all nice and fine if people want to do that on their on their you know private time and all that. Um, I'm personally not interested in that. I'm interested in the real world, uh, so to speak. And my interest in fiction is only to the degree that it's 
mainly a type of art where art imitates life, life imitates art. So it's not art for art's sake. It's art that actually has something to do with the real world. It just expresses itself in a different way than the real world does to help us kind of shift, as many artists would say, and even Scott McDonald said in his book, uh, art, the, one of the main purposes of art is to help us uh, shift our perspective on something. And maybe there can be an opportunity for personal growth or a realization of truth or, or whatever else, although that's getting into art theory uh, a little much, maybe a little too much for this episode. But suffice it to say, regarding uh, the RLSH folks, I mean, the, real, the so-called real-life superheroes, man— Mean well, which is fine, but I think the best utility they have at this point is really they're just kind of glorified culture jammers, which is good for that purpose. I think culture jamming is all good and wonderful, but it's not the same thing as vigilantism. Um, the real-life superheroes are not using force for the most part. There have been some who have made tutor uh, tutorials on YouTube where they're openly telling people – uh, their viewers that, you know, if you come across a crime in progress, call the police. So, like, openly advocating that kind of stuff. Um, Not Phoenix Jones. <laughs> Although, which, who's who's yeah. the except? Well, he, yeah. he's more of an actual vigilante, which is good. Or he's closer to that. Um, but, yeah, most of the other other folks I've seen are are really... There, there's like there's a like other agendas at play, or they're kind of like a, a police auxiliary type thing. Even the Wikipedia page it's like, on RL. Uh, it's it's like uh, I guess kind of like a neighborhood watch. Uh, like it, it's it's only it's yeah. not a neighborhood watch. It's kind of like a real life superhero watch. Oh, you see a crime, call the cops. It's a neighborhood watch where you get to dress up in a costume, basically. Um, I mean that that's that's how <laughs> many of them kind of treat it. And obviously that I kind of really disagree with pretty profusely for for a lot of reasons, which should be obvious Never to this call audience. The bludgies. <laughs> Yeah, um, that that and for other reasons, too. Right. It's also an abdication of personal responsibility. Like if you see the woman being raped, why don't you fucking stop it instead of calling for the you see, there's there's many problems involved with all this. So anyway, um, now that being said, I still think the RLSH people are useful as a culture jamming mechanism or technique or class of techniques and such and i think that's good and they are subverting the uh comic book tropes and and imagery and such and they're trying to apply it to real life and in some ways promoting vigilantism at least in some roundabout way which which i still think is good but i think for most of them that's kind of where it ends it's it's mainly a culture jamming thing and believe you me i would rather people do culture jamming than than go do you know uh, the whole, like, let, let's reform the system, reform the state thing, which is actually much, much worse, obviously. I've written about that at length, wrote my first book on it, in fact. Um, so there's that. Um, but we're, if we're talking about actual vigilantes, I think very, 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 very few of the so-called real-life superheroes are actual vigilantes, and even of them, you're not going to hear about most of them because they're doing stuff that the state would consider to be illegal. And the one exception to this would probably be Phoenix Jones, who, remember, he did get in trouble with the government. He very he was in court. There was the issue of should he unmask even to testify kind of thing. I mean, there there was his story, and I would suggest this to the audience, um, because this could also easily be an episode by itself, is the whole story of Phoenix Jones, because he's very, very unique that even most of the RLSH people don't like him. And I do, personally. Oh, he's, um, he's my favorite one. <laughs> He's also, but he's also the one that's the most well documented. He's also the one that's had the most media exposure. And remember, he's also the only one that's been unmasked. And out of respect for him, I will not refer to him by uh, his legal identity. That's why I refer to him as Phoenix Jones, in much the same way that I kind of do the same thing with Rayo. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, Phoenix was unmasked, and that's um, that. That's a shame, but. I don't completely blame him because the media was basically kind of threatening to kind of petition the government to kind of throw him in jail if he did not mask kind of thing. And uh, and Phoenix basically kind of took a gamble on it. And so far, it didn't seem to be too, too bad because, of course, he had the UFC thing to kind of fall back on. So right, there's that. Right. But, yeah, Phoenix Jones is the closest thing to at least the uh, the most publicly documented most recently modern example of a vigilante. And again, some of his methods I disagree with, but you know what? 
the man actually went out and did stuff. And for that, I have nothing but respect for him for, even though I would take issue that maybe his time would have been better spent going after organized crime rather than hassling a couple violent drunks on a, on, on a weekend evening. But again, right. I don't want, but again, I don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good because those violent drunks really were assaulting women and just other innocent people at the same time. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, again, per don't let the enemy, uh, don't let the good be the, uh, don't let the um, perfect be the enemy of the good, right? And and again, even if people wanted to become vigilantes, they would have to start somewhere. So probably better to start with the violent drunks rather than. You know, a crime boss who's going to make sure you're dead, dead, dead with uh, wearing concrete shoes, going for a little one-way trip to the riverbank, so to speak. Right, right. So, yeah, guys, I would highly recommend you check out Phoenix Jones. Uh, you know, it's obviously, you know, there's uh, not perfect, as Kyle said, but at the same time, uh, if you want a, an ex a, a real-life case study of a vigilante, uh, you know, a vigilante today, oh, man, it's uh, it's definitely an entertaining one. And the dude has uh, the dude has some balls. And uh, additionally, I mean, he's UFC trained, so you see some uh, some very interesting uh, uh, interesting uh, <laughs> uh, scenarios happen uh, there when he was uh, when he was out there on the street, so to speak. So highly recommend that. But I want to change gears a little bit, uh, although not really. We're still still talking about vigilantism. But one thing that uh, the, the reason I was most excited to do this episode with Kyle was we were talking about the potential that vigilantism could have, and one of those ways is uh, a tool in fighting back against propaganda. Uh, you know, directed against anarchism. And let me explain real briefly here. So, obviously, there's this this idea that we've we've, we've talked about already that you know the, the the you know the cops are out there. They're they're doing a great job. They're uh, you know the bludgies. They're they're doing great work. And uh, you know they're the only ones that can do this sort of thing, right? There's also the <laughs> The idea that uh, uh, you know anarchists, you know uh, uh, that anarchists are demonized in the media. It's typically in the form of uh, you know kind of the uh, the syndicalist variety, you know the ones that go out and do the, use uh, the black block tactic and things. So that's kind of the the view of the view towards anarchism in the mainstream when it's brought up at all. So here's here's kind of the idea. So I guess anarchist vigilantes go out and stop real crime. So you know your your thieves, your rapists, your murderers. You know, anarchist vigilantes go out and, you know, they stop these these crimes and what they do, uh, what they do, whether they just stop it or if they uh, uh, or if they drop off, you know, the or if they ha handcuff and drop the guy off at the police station. I don't know how I don't know exactly how that would all come come about. But uh, once that happens over and over and over again and, you know, crime rates drop and, uh, you know, these these vigilantes like Phoenix Jones, say there's an anarchist version of him that's, that's doing it the way Colin, I would like it to like it to happen then the you know the media attention that that would garner would be quite significant the cops the, the bludgies would get worried like oh man they're actually they're doing our job for us uh and they wouldn't like that you know it's illegal so once this happens over and over again and the media reports on it and it's these anarchists are out there uh you know stopping crime what's going on here I thought anarchists were these violent crazy people that you know wanted to overthrow the government well it's the last part not a, you know maybe the last part maybe not completely true or not entirely false but but regardless, there'd be this positive media spin to it uh, that, you know, anarchist vigilantes were out there stopping crime. And I think that could garner, you know, more public support. Well, if, if they're out there, you know, keeping us safe, uh, you know, these anarchists, then maybe they really aren't that bad. So that's kind of the the idea, Kyle. I, maybe I didn't flesh that out as, as well as I could, but could have. But, but what do you think? I think there is great potential in it. Obviously, that kind of proposal the only way to, re to really see if it's any good or not is to actually go out and like do it um but suffice it to say suffice it to say there's there's definitely potential in it um you know if, if there's any understanding of how the government police really kind of fall flat on their face it's not just from dr roger roots but it would also come more broadly from like sam conkin and the agorists where the reason why they promote the use of black and gray markets as a way of trying to at least shrink the state and then eventually abolish it as the ultimate goal for them is that they understand that the state and especially the bludgies more particularly the so-called law enforcement the blue coats really are not very competent in their work and whenever they are competent it's usually for ulterior motives it's a political persecution of some kind um, they go after a Ross Albrecht type 
rather than an actual mob boss and so forth. That's usually what's kind of going on there. They really are the not so secret police. And, and then also right. too, there, there are those those you know often often uh, often cited court cases where uh, the Supreme Court cases where the, the police have no duty to actually protect you or your property. Right. So the so whole thing about per- so the whole thing on on the sides of many squad cars across this sorry excuse of a country where it to says protect, protect and serve. But to protect and serve whom, which has always been the real question, and you know different people have different answers to that. I would just say stop making assumptions about protecting and serving the people and really kind of examine who are they really protecting and serving, you know, by their actions. protect and serve the establishment. By their actions, ye shall know them, saith the Lord. So for all you right-wing Christian people and all that, by their actions, ye shall know them. Not their words, not their rhetoric, not their propaganda. By their actions, ye shall know them. So how many people have the cops murdered and who have they murdered and who are they not murdering and so forth? And even if we get away from the issue of like police brutality and police murders uh, and so forth, even if we get away with that from that, um, who are their actions really benefiting, right? Who's really funding the police pensions? You know, there's uh, like who's really giving the police the military hardware, right, through those DHS contracts and such, you know, to the tune of like six figures for each major uh, bear cat and whatever else, right? I, th- I think that's kind of the point here. So with all of that, like what about actual murders, robberies, rapes, muggings, actual real crimes, kidnappings even. I mean, how many kid? actually, here's a great question. How many kidnappings have been solved by government police? I mean, I can't tell you how many times when I've been at the gym or, or even, um, even somewhat more recently at, at the bar when there would be a freaking TV on and, there, and there's like some sort of true crime type thing on. It's like this unsolved kidnapping expose. And I'm like, yeah, why are these, uh, you know, so unsolved, right? I mean, what are the police doing? Twiddling their thumbs? How, you know, do they need to like call up Sherlock Holmes to try and get an answer to much of anything? I mean, it's about that bad. <laughs> right, right. And in the next so, case, with with, uh, with art, with with the the art on television, Art does not imitate reality <laughs> when it comes to the crime shows. No, because – right, because the crime shows, you have things like Law and – Order probably being one of the more um, more recognizable ones. And, or, and, you know, or CSI where, where you know, it's, it's – uh, you know, the, the – what, what that's, it's, I, that's I the high-tech version of it. School, yeah, where it's like, yeah, well, we solve all the crimes. We're that good. Yeah, that, we doesn't have, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen, yeah, which, is why, we, which is why I think this, this – like this, this vigilante thing, like it's – there's – it 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 benefit you know benefits uh, for those who you know want you know want their anarchism to have a, an impact on society at large. I mean that's a great way uh, to to make that happen. Uh, you know and even if, even if not that uh, for proprietarian anarchists, you know that I mean that that's that'd be a really really rewarding thing uh, if you you know help someone you know secure their property rights uh, like you know from from rape or murder or whatever it is right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so it's it's very interesting to look at the difference between the fictional art versus reality when it comes to depictions of both vigilantism as well as the so-called law enforcement, right? Because in art, law enforcement, um, let's say popular TV shows more specifically, they're always competent. The police always get their man. The law and order episodes always end with a solution where the actual bad guy is thrown to prison. And sometimes, you know, the lawyers might, or the prosecutor might have a moral quandary, but it's still for the greater good. Like the one episode where they took that one homeless guy and they threw him in this, uh, basically in prison, but at least he'll have a good meal and so forth. It's just like, oh my goodness. (laughs) They really are hypocrites. They really, really are. And then, and then, of course, when you look at more of the vigilante side of things, the artistic side is more uh, the superhumans and the cosmic battles and the JLA and all the team ups and all this, you know, radioactive waste changing people's lives with spider bites and whatever else. And it, it's kind of like, okay, this is kind of really getting quite fantastical in, in the negative sense and so forth. This is getting so fantastic that even I can't believe it. So, yeah, suspension of disbelief ain't really working for me too well. Um, but then when you look at real life, it's kind of like, 
where are the vigilantes? I mean, maybe there's a few operating, and I really sure hope there are, but if they are, it's pretty much all clandestine or underreported or, or thereabouts. And, you know, what I would kind of like is if it's not it's not just vigilantes going out and stopping crime. There has to be a way of making sure that though they are reported on, but it's not sensationalized, which is going to be an awfully hard balancing act. Yeah. Like, I mean, how do you do that? Because the, because the the tendency of mainstream media, especially now, uh, now, obviously, alternative media for people who are serious can actually do it and do it right and cover the stories and not sensationalize it if they're actually serious. Uh, but eventually, if it goes on long enough, and especially if, like, you know, there's actual property damage because organized crimes being taken out and so forth, mainstream media is going to pick it up, you know, if this is successful enough. And then, you know, then it's like, how are they not going to sensationalize it? I mean, here's here's actually an interesting example, and this goes back to the artistic side of it. Look at, like, the Spider-Man comics. And more in particular, there's that infamous character, pretty much almost an antagonist, but J. Jonah Jameson, remember him? Peter Parker's boss, the guy who basically says, I hate Spider-Man, yet Spider-Man technically works for him as a freelance photographer, right? Um, yeah, J. Jonah Jameson constantly is running headlines. This is like a long thing running. This is part of his char whole character uh, for like decades is that J. Jonah Jameson is constantly trying to get Spider-Man in jail. He's saying he's a menace, he's a villain, even though Spider-Man takes out actual villains in, in that fictional Marvel universe and so forth. So it, what I'm trying to say is that if art imitates life and life imitates art, I would speculate that mainstream media would probably act very similar to J. Jonah Jameson. In that, the that, and I think another interesting thing to think about, too, here is uh, like if it ever got to the level of organized crime, uh, we're, again, we're, we're, I mean that that, that publicity is being gained, uh, that massive publicity, then you, you got to wonder what the police are going to be doing then too. They they probably don't they probably you know divert uh, they probably don't divert a lot of resources to those things. Uh, I would imagine, uh, or if they did, you know, whatever. But just imagine if if that started become becoming publicized and you know these organized crime bosses started going down. Uh, I would I would bet money. That the bludgies would focus more of their time, money, effort, t time, money, and effort on the vigilantes than they would the actual organized crime folks. What do you I think? agree. I agree. And again, to go to the more artistic side of things, let's talk about Bruce Wayne, Batman. Let's talk about him because obviously people are more familiar with, well, Batman works with Commissioner James Gordon, and thus he's on the side of the government police, and blah blah blah. And it's like, yeah, you know what? Let's look at early Batman. Let's look at Batman when Gordon actually hated his guts before they formed their alliance and later friendship and all of that. Um, Batman was considered an outlaw. They were constantly trying, uh, Gordon especially, trying to constantly arrest Batman, like all the time. Um, especially people who are familiar uh, more specifically with something like Batman Year One in particular, really emphasize this point even more so than other uh, adaptations and interpretations of the Batman mythos, is that originally when Bruce Wayne started, like, he was really a vigilante, like, in the classical sense. Like, the government police wanted his head on a stick if they could. It didn't matter that he was taking out the Falcone uh, crime gang. It didn't matter that, that Batman was breaking up a lot of this stuff. It didn't matter. You know, well, that was the reign of the police. The police should have done it. Who thinks this guy is wearing a cape and cowl doing it, doing our jobs better than we can? So there was also kind of this jealous, envious, prideful, but in a bad sense, uh, kind of attitude by the government police. And Gordon epitomized that in, like, one character. And that's why the original relationship between Batman and Commissioner Gordon was actually the prime antagonistic relationship of the of, of the Detective Comics series up until Gordon was like, oh, well, he's now like an ally or whatever. That was like the original thing, and that makes more sense to me in terms of real life. Because in real life, what would probably be a scenario was, is not to combine the DC Universe and Marvel Universe too much, but in real life, you probably would have mainstream media acting more like J. Jonah Jameson, demonizing the vigilantes in the public eye, or at least trying to, and then people either agree or disagree with it, the, the, their readers and such. 
like. And then in real life, you probably would have a Commissioner Gordon type, part of the government police, not a high-level bureaucrat, but a mid-level bureaucrat. He's got subordinates under him, but he's high up enough to where he can actually make the command decisions in the field. But he would also be tasked by his superiors to bring in the vigilantes, i.e. arrest them, kill them, do whatever it takes to stop them forcibly. And that makes more sense to me in real life, where you would have the original version of James Gordon representing the government, and then you would have J. Jonah Jameson, as he's always been, demonize, 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 and basically kind of making the case for why an er the early version of Commissioner Gordon needs to f use force to bring in the Batman. That is probably what would happen in real life. It doesn't matter if the vigilantes in real life are successful or not. Obviously, if they're not successful, the government may take it seriously. They may not take it seriously. They may decide to kind of blow it, you know, uh, if they're not successful, may decide to kind of, you know, water under the bridge kind of thing. The more important question is what if they are successful? What if they do start – let me put it this way, Shane. Imagine, if you will, libertarian vigilantes taking down MS-13 forever. What if they took down the mafiosi? What if they took down any of the, uh, let's say, even a prison gang? That would be rather interesting, wouldn't it? And not just stopping them here and there, but I mean ending them permanently to the point where their infra where the um, the gang's infrastructure is so demolished they cannot recover, even if they still have a few operating cells scattered about. Can you imagine that? I honestly, I honestly cannot. I honestly cannot. And, and to kind of take this to the next level, uh, you know, maybe prematurely, but uh, I would imagine, uh, you know, this is speculation, but uh, I would imagine in some of those, uh, you know, that some of those, uh, some of these really high up organization, high up, uh, you know, mafia organizations, there'd be some ties to police uh, as well. Well, so there already are. Ex there already are because, yeah. and, and see, this was interesting because this was also mentioned in the early Batman mythos when Commissioner Gordon was an antagonist. But actually, the writers were smart because they were actually taking this from real life. Art imitates life. Life imitates art. Where the government police actually have informants who are not normal people or people being blackmailed or people who are nonviolent drug users being black and not any of that, but actual real criminals, usually gang members, organized crime who snitch on their own people, who snitch on other, you know, uh, mafia dons or whatever else. So the government already does that kind of secret police stuff as a matter of course. Well, I, I was I was saying I was saying more along the lines of uh, I mean it it wouldn't be I, it certainly wouldn't be out of outside the realm of possibility if uh, one of these uh, like MS13 for example if they're smuggling in a bunch of cocaine or something. Uh, I'm saying if there was you know what uh, uh, I guess uh, you know I guess some sort of a uh, working relationship uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all. And uh, you know, if a, if a vigilante were to take down one of those organizations and find one of those ties, it might actually be be a, an elevating factor to say, okay, well, you know, I've taken out MS-13. Uh, now let's see what I can do in regards to the state, or what or the, what this committee of vigilance can do in regards to the state. Well, I'm I'm completely not surprised because um, I'm trying to remember what it was called. But you know, the government has had a long history of working hand in hand with criminal. Uh, elements, whether it's like drug running like the CIA did, the Dark Alliance uh, that, that Gary Webb wrote and so forth, like this, this, is, this is kind of par for the course. Um, I'm really not really too, too surprised that, you know, the biggest um, attractor of criminality, of course, being the state itself, actually attracts the more typical private uh, criminals, whether individuals or the organized criminal syndicates. Uh, to themselves, to where they have a working relationship, because we want to cooperate with each other in much the same way that the state cooperates with multinational corporations. Because at that point, what's the difference between a multinational corporation that's in league with the state, that that receives undue favors from the state, whether through lobbying or, or other means, uh, relative to an organized criminal syndicate that is working hand in hand with the state, usually the police or prosecution or district attorneys or whatever else? I mean, at what point is it the normal processes of democracy versus when it's actual real corruption? I mean, at that point, I mean, it's almost hand in glove a little bit, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So, so the the idea here, just to just to reiterate this, is as far as you know, libertarian or anarchist, uh, you know, uh, vigilantes, 
is you know uh, starting small, like Phoenix Jones, like going out and uh, you know combating kind of the uh, the small crime, but still violations of person and property. So you know rape, murder, theft, um, those sorts of things. And uh, you know once experience is gained and uh, you know you uh, become more efficient, and uh, maybe you have, uh, as Ben Stone talked about, a committee of vigilance. Uh, then you move up to, as we've been discussing, you know, organized crime. And, uh, you know, once uh, once that sort of happens, uh, I, I would say at that point, uh, you would have, uh, even if the mainstream media is uh, doing its normal thing, normal uh, routine of demonizing, uh, you know, uh, uh, vigilantism, uh, I would still imagine that there would be at least some sort of positive public perception. And uh, then, you know, just keep working up higher uh, Then you can work up to the state. Uh, and as I, as I said before, uh, you know, if it comes out that, uh, you know, these are anarchist, uh, these are, these are anarchist vigilantes and, you know, they're doing all of this good stuff. They're doing all these great things. And, uh, you know, they're doing the job that the, that the bludgy should have done. And the public kind of recognizes that. Uh, I do think that could be uh, one factor. I don't think it'll ever, I don't think a free society will ever exist, but at the same time, if there's, uh, you know, one, one, uh, tactic that could be used to, uh, speed up the, uh, the falling of the state, I think it is something like this. Well, yeah, of course. And to kind of re uh, to kind of highlight something you mentioned a moment ago about the state working uh, in league with criminals. Remember, there was Operation Fast and Furious that was exposed years ago, where right, the ATF, yes. where the ATF basically directly armed the Mexican drug cartels. Um, they the official story was that well, it was it was a sting operation, but then they never actually got the guns back, and the guns were used to murder other people. Yeah, yeah, that oh, so, yeah, exactly, yeah. So and, and not only that, now that that's a real life thing that happened. Um, there's also been various other plot lines in various so-called superhero comic books where the, the where it's more of like a multi issue, like like arc type story where there's like a vast conspiracy of sorts. And then the superhero basically finds out that the, that it's some sort of government black ops, military industrial complex thing behind this one particular organized criminal syndicate thing. And then they have a big showdown. But. But of course, they never actually. The writers are never actually allowed allowed to actually say, actually, this is the consequence of government. It's always kind of couched in the sense of, well, it's a corrupt thing area of of the state. It's 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 this particular black ops thing that went rogue, it, or it's or it's this portion of the military industrial complex, not the entirety of the military industrial complex, but just this one portion of it that killed just. One too many civilians in some, you know, uh, you know, armpit of the world elsewhere, right? In order to justify arms sales or whatever bioweapon was the focus of the particular plot line and so forth. So it's interesting that some of the storylines start kind of getting close to reality, but then they just kind of just stop. They don't really go all the way. And then when you look at actual real life history, in some ways it's more simple and to the point. But in another sense, it's also all the more horrifying because in some ways it's so predictably ordinary. Like, again, I mean, the CIA being involved in, in drug running like during the 70s or whatever, that's not, that's not the same thing as like Brainiac trying to like brainwash every person on earth to like bend to his will or whatever. But it's at least kind of plausible, right? Uh, the CIA right. drug running. Um, I mean, that that that's kind of... I, I guess I guess maybe that's what kind of some people are, are kind of like looking for. They want the fantastical, you know, almost science fiction, almost kind of elements to it as well, but not real science fiction, not even or even kind of a science fiction that's cartoonish to the, to the degree of like uh, like a Rick and Morty type thing, but sci-fi that's kind of mixed with like high fantasy kind of thing so there's a little bit of dungeons and dragons type stuff going on there too at the same time uh it's a mix of different genres and so forth depending on what specific uh superhero comic book you're reading and so forth but if in terms of real life um yeah i mean like i mean i hate to say this but kind of and i, I know we're, we need to get on to talk about some other related things but just one thing popped in my head uh, if you think about like what the so-called anonymous does when they like do a DDoS attack or and so forth, and uh, or or you even think about like whistleblowers and all that, I mean they're not exactly vigilantes necessarily, but I guess it would be vigilantism light maybe because they're doing they're, things. I I don't know if it even, I don't I don't think it could be classified as vigilantism. I mean it's it's public awareness. It's not actually pursuing the ends of just. It's not actually taking the initiative themselves and in, in, in achieving justice. 
It's just kind of public perception. It's just it's just uh, sensational YouTube videos. It's kind of all, all and honest was done for a long time. Sure, and and I guess a whistleblower is not the same as a vigilante, right? Because the whistleblower just tells the truth about whatever they were able to do, whereas a vigilante is actually like using force to pursue justice, right? So yeah. there 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 is a difference there. Um, I were as a side note, I remember the mainstream media accusing Ed, uh, even Snowden, Ed Snowden, of being a vigilante, and I remember snickering at the time, like, yeah, where's his, and where's his grappling hook? Because <laughs> I was looking, I like where where's Ed Snowden's uh, utility belt? I can't find one, right? I mean, unless no, they're no, talking if, about if, his if, USB Ed, stick. if Ed Snowden would have infiltrated the NSA and just you know set fire to like set fire to <laughs> facilities, yes, he would have been a vigilante, but. That's not what happened. <laughs> that's not that's not what happened. So yeah, mainstream media has a tendency to exaggerate things, kind of like the fictional J. Jonah Jameson likes to fic likes to exaggerate about how Spider Man's a villain, even though he's not, and and so forth. So that that's that's kind of what I'm thinking is that in the superhero comic book type stuff, the, it originally started kind of as a artistic yet somewhat more realistic. Uh, reflection of of real life vigilantism, but then as time went on, it got more and more fantastical, got more and more away from it. Uh, you know, where like what Batman works with James Gordon, the the police commissioner, and that's like the normal Batman mythos now. It's kind of like that. What what reality did you guys step into? You know, right, right. Uh, that that's that's not real life. Real life would be the early James Gordon. Real life would be J. Jonah Jameson demonizing Spider-Man. That that makes more sense. Right. Because even though normal common people, if you think oh, let me let me put this another way, too, since we're talking about the art versus life thing before we get on to other things, the if you think about people getting excited about like superhero movies, people get excited over superhero movies, more generally speaking, I think would be a fair statement. The question is why? Because the vigilantes are doing illegal things more often than not. So why would normal people want to go see a movie about that? Why would normal people want to read comic books about that? And I would suggest that maybe one potential reason or rationale would be there actually is a very culturally ingrained admiration within American culture that epitomizes vigilantes as heroes, normal heroes. That there's something admirable about vigilantes with by Americans in, in a very, very cultural sense, not counting the government. Um, because in large part due to the fact that historically vigilantes uh, were, as with that one example I mentioned a little bit ago, uh, were people that were usually frontiersmen, not people in the cities. Uh, so that the comic books got that one wrong, of course. Uh, oh, the vigilantes were always in the cities. What are you talking about? Real life was that it was the other way around, actually. Um, but, you know, there, there's that, I suppose. Uh, so right. basically, that's kind of what I'm getting at, is that the relationship between real life vigilantism and then the fictional artistic portrayal of vigilantism have gone in very different and separate directions, even though it originally started from pretty much a, a, a somewhat accurate portrayal. And so now the question is, okay, well, what about real-life vigilantism? What can be done now? And yeah, when you were mentioning earlier about like libertarian vigilantes like taking on common criminals and then kind of you know tackling organized crime as they can and then eventually work up to the state, uh, that's not actually a, a really bad way to go because that's going by matters of degree, right? Levels of difficulty, so to speak. It's yeah. It's, it's not uh, as you say so often in the Vonnie podcast. It's uh, it's it's not uh, you know running a marathon before you know taking a step. You're working up once you you know once you become more competent, and uh, you gain more experience. And as I'm going to get to here in a moment, as you uh, obtain uh, you know more resources and funding, then uh, you can you know work up to to the to to those uh, higher levels such as the state. But I want to before before we get into uh, before we get into kind of what the training, what what sort of training would be necessary for, uh, you know, uh, uh, vigilantes, I'd like to, you know, I, I want to go ahead and kind of just read the few selected passages I, I took from uh, Ben Stone's book on forming committees of vigilance and uh, related subjects. Uh, so it, it's just a few paragraphs that I thought were particularly uh, important here. So, uh, so uh, and this is uh, Ben Ben Stone's edition of Version and Sabotage. You can listen to it for free. In audiobook format, you can download it. You can uh, uh, you can download the PDF, all that good stuff. LibertyUnderAttack.com forward slash Ben Stone 
audiobook. So here we go. Quote, a committee of vigilance should be a secret unit formed of like-minded friends made up of whatever combination of dedicated underground activists you have available. The committee, the committee should concern itself with one thing, justice. Uh, so yeah, secret. You don't want to, you know, start a Facebook group, uh, you know, Central Illinois, Vig uh, uh, Central, Central Illinois Committee of Vigilance. Probably wouldn't be a wise thing to, uh, to do. So uh, moving forward, Quote, the primary purpose of a committee of vigilance should be to develop target lists, hold target review hearings, do target risk, benefit analysis, and make final decisions on the fate of the target, then communicate that decision to the enforcement wing. The secondary purpose of a committee of vigilance should be to discuss potential new members of the underground, develop trust lists and contact lists, both to be kept encrypted and secured, and expand network connections. Uh, end quote. So I'll stop there for a moment, and then we'll get to the funding here. But uh, so far, I I I'm, I'm, I can't say I I, I don't like the, uh, the what uh, don't like the the sort of uh, arrangement here. What do you think, Kyle? You know that's 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 kind of very interesting. Um, I think my own bias or preference would be that I really don't like groupy type things. You know, you look at like the. To, to go back to the fictional stuff for another moment, sorry, I know I keep kind of dragging back to that, but again, that's that's kind of what I'm a little bit more familiar with, unfortunately. When you look at like a fictional portrayal of something like the Justice League, uh, you know, from the DC universe, or probably more people are familiar with the Marvel universe's version of like the Avengers, right? The Avengers, Avengers assemble, right? Um, there's very much kind of this groupy thing, right? We're going to combine our powers and we're going to be greater than, you know, the sum is greater than the whole of its parts or whatever. Um, I don't think that's quite accurate. Um, you know, there is, there is a reason actually to, to, and to re reiterate about art imitating life, life imitating art. Um, there is actually one particular so-called superhero who actually was probably, one of the very few realistic portrayals of what a vigilante actually could be in real life. And that, of course, is Rorschach. He had, he's not a metahuman. This is like a superhero name that I, I don't know who you're talking about here. <laughs> that's no, it was Rorschach. That was his, that was his pseudonym. Okay. Uh, Walter, Walter well, Kovac. <laughs> Walter, well, Walter Walter Kovacs was was actually uh, was was what he was born as in in but yeah he was one of the Watchmen right the Watchmen uh, there was actually a movie by that same title too the Watchmen so it was part of the Watchmen and he joined the Watchmen and there were these other so-called superheroes which were mainly normal humans more vigilantes uh, only one of them was a metahuman. Uh, but yeah, but then of course the the history of that uh, or the story of that Watchmen thing was that the Watchmen fell apart, and then and then because of this legislative act called the Keen Act, the uh, you know vigilantism and superheroisming uh, basically was illegal. But the only one who carried on was Rorschach, and he did it even when it was illegal, and he did it alone uh, and all that, even after the Watchmen fell apart. And all I could think of is. You know what? I know he may have meant well, at least some of them did, but even he kind of admitted in some of his, you know, internal monologues in the actual comic book, this wasn't in the movie, uh, in the actual comic book that he was kind of young, younger and naive when he joined the Watchmen and that he's since matured since, you know, he's now illegally doing the vigilantism by himself. And, you know, Rorschach was a normal human. He didn't have any so-called powers. He was not a metahuman. He was not a mutant. He wasn't an alien. He wasn't a robot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but he, but unlike a Bruce Wayne or Oliver uh, Queen type, uh, Green Arrow, uh, he wasn't rich either. Because remember, most in, in the superhero fiction all that, if somebody is not a uh, metahuman, such as a mutant or an alien, et cetera, if they really are just plainly human, they usually tend to be like filthy rich, like a Bruce Wayne or Oliver Queen. Well, R Walter Kovacs transcended both of that. Be and not only that, but it was made a point of that he was actually rather quite poor. So how could a poor man with no powers go out and be a vigilante? And it was basically, he was essentially a grittier version of Batman. You know, he did his detective skills, but he didn't have a lot of tools, but he was very good at improvising a lot of things. And a lot of times he just beat the crap out of people, and sometimes he would even kill them. So the whole Batman rule didn't even apply to him. Um, you know, this was the same guy when he was thrown in prison, and this was both in the, uh, the, the movie and the comic book. 
uh, during those scenes when he was in that prison for a little bit of time. He, this was the guy who said in front of that cafeteria right after he attacked the guy who was about to stab him in the back quite literally, you know, you misunderstood something. I'm not locked in here with you. You are locked in here with me. That was Rorschach. So you have this very gritty, very kind of film noir kind of aesthetic about the guy. I mean, the guy wears a trench coat and a fedora hat, for Christ's sakes. And then, of course, because he's the real vigilante, and of course, I think I kind of understood what the writers were doing here at the end of The Watchmen, not to spoil it too much, because most people have either read it or, or watched the movie. Um, uh, he, Kovacs is murdered. Rorschach is murdered at the end by one of the other Watchmen because Rorschach was going to tell the truth about how one of the other Watchmen was actually the real supervillain of the whole thing. That's like the big M. Night Shyamalan twist of the whole thing was basically in this kind of alternate history of America bro brokering an end to the Cold War between Soviet Russia and the United States by basically staging false flag uh, terror attacks that resulted pretty much in the deaths of many, many people. And Rorschach had the proof that he was going to go tell the truth of it. And one of the Watchmen says, no, in order to maintain the peace of the new peace that has now ended the Cold War or about to end the Cold War, uh, Rorschach needs to die because he he's not willing to – that was a big thing. He's not willing to compromise. You need to compromise, Rorschach. And he's like, no, I'm not going to compromise. And then, of course, he was murdered. And then pretty much that's when the Watchmen ends is with the death of Rorschach, the death of the good man who would not compromise, who isn't special – in any real way, but he had a very hard life, but he did have a sense of justice. He was a real vigilante, uh, even can, even by on the standards of the other so-called superheroes. But of course he had to die. And that is also very symbolic too. And I think what the writers were also kind of trying to say was that in real life, the real vigilantes had to die as well because like Rorschach, they were uncompromising in their pursuit of justice. You see kind of how that little game little works in terms of artistic interpretation? Hmm. That's yeah, why and that is who why doesn't know what the hell you're talking about, but yeah. <laughs> well, there's I mean some people some of the conspiracists would say there was kind of a, an, an Illuminati influence in the Watchmen. I don't know about that, but I will say this. Um, there is a reason why the Watchmen comic book series is the number one, or at least the entire collection as, as the so-called graphic novel is the number one graph uh, best-selling graphic novel of all time. And I think that was one of the biggest reasons why, because there was also a lot of fluff in there that didn't really add anything to the plot. But I think it was really the portrayal of Rorschach that really kind of was an attempt to try and do a couple things. One was to get the fictional betrayal of vigilantism to mirror what was the original portrayal of vigilantism in comic books as it originally was and trying to get back to that where you had normal people – having courage to use force to stop organized crime and other sorts of criminals, which is what Rorschach was doing, even when it was illegal in, in, the, in the plot line. But then it was also an attempt to kind of look at, well, in the modern world, how would that all play out? And what the writers hypothesized with the death of Rorschach was that the good vigilantes would have to be murdered by some of the people who maybe they would be working with at one time, but would eventually betray them because ulterior motives, because of politics, because of fake pieces that would be brokered by politicians on the basis of false flag terror attacks, which was part of that plot line. So I know that that's, that's kind huh. of maybe some ways and that's a little bit convoluted, but I don't know, man. I mean, false flag terror attacks are a real thing. You know, I mean, there's actual real history, maybe beyond the scope of this episode, that goes into various documented false flag terror, uh, state-sponsored false flag terror attacks that were conducted by governments. So the writers of the Watchmen were actually very wise, in many ways. I don't necessarily agree that that with their hypothesis that the good vigilantes would have to be murdered as an eventual consequence. I do think that is one possibility. Yes, I don't think it's the only one. Right, so, uh, so 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 I guess the 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 long the long answer to, or I guess the your thoughts on, uh, I guess on the committees of vigilance, you prefer, or I guess your preference would be alone because of uh, how it's been portrayed in comics and or also, at most or at most maybe a Batman and Robin type situation or 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 actually I would say this, the only one that seems to actually work, at least in a fictional sense, would be something like the Bat Family, which was originally like Batman and Robin, but then Robin kept getting, you know, 
substituted in was different people and then the the bat family kind of grew but it was never a formal thing and it was always about allegiance to bruce wayne as kind of like a de facto monarch uh so there wasn't any necessarily anything wrong with that he was just kind of like the patriarch of this kind of patchwork quilted family uh hence why it's called the bat family but it was never like a formal thing like the justice league or the avengers or even the watchmen so the formal organizations are really problematic. And remember one thing too, there was also that one plot line about the JLA when Batman was a member of it, where it was discovered he actually had backup plans to systematically incapacitate each member of the JLA in case they were compromised. But then one of the supervillains, Rachel Ghoul, basically uh, figured out how to uh, turn Batman's original plans into a lethal version that would kill off the members of the Justice League. And then later after the whole uh crisis was over the justice league tried to vote out batman and then batman was like you know what if you guys are are trying to decide whether to vote me out and and you're not really concerned with like potential abuses of your own powers cuz we're basically a group of the most powerful people on the damn planet then maybe y- you don't need me to be a member of this i'm not really wanted here because remember one key aspect of bruce wayne's personality is that he was always very suspicious of pow- uh, of concentrations of power much like how minarchus used to be And he was acting that same way with the JLA. So that whole dynamic about concentrations of power is actually kind of substituting – well, really what the JLA was 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 kind of a nicer portrayal of the state actually. And Batman was more kind of like – more of like a classical liberal actually. See, that's what was actually really going on there because the whole story was about concentrations of power. At least that one particular huh. plot line. And Batman almost got thrown out of the JLA over it because they – each one of them almost died over it. Like even Superman almost got killed and they had to like do this – not to go on too long about this, but they had to basically do this like get a kryptonite knife and cut open his ch- – I mean it was it was a really big deal. Everybody was kind of screwed up. But everything kind of sorted out at the end as is typical with comic book plot lines. But Batman was almost thrown out. But he was like – and and Batman kind of walked out of there like a boss out of that one meeting where it's like I don't need to wait for a vote, you know right, I'm not right. wanted here. Like so there's there's there are bigger issues here at play that the comic book writers do try to kind of get at, and they get it get it up up to a point, and then they have to stop because then it starts getting too close to home. So anyway, getting back to uh, the actual vigilantism, at least in real life and sorts, I think. It would probably mimic something more like the Watchmen and Rorschach more particularly because that's about as realistic as it got. Um, I don't think it has to end like it did with Rorschach. I think that's very open-ended, and I think that's only one possible future. And uh, maybe with some libertarian revolution – or excuse me, uh, libertarian vigilantes, maybe some of them would end up dead. Maybe somebody would snitch the cops, and they'd end up with a hole in the back of their head in some dirty alley somewhere. That's quite possible, yes. But I also think it's quite possible that, you know, MS-13 is completely dismantled by libertarian vigilantes doing what they do best, too. Right, right. So as with uh, most libertarian and anarchist ventures, one constant issue is funding. (laughs) So let's see what uh, Ben Stone has to say about uh, funding a committee of vigilance or even, you know, just funding uh, uh, funding, uh, an individual uh, vigilante. So. He says, quote, compared to funding a state-based justice system, vigilante justice is practically free and usually funds itself. Again, stateless societies tend to solve problems like funding on their own very quickly. However, getting a committee of vigilance started and functional under the current circumstance will cost a small amount of money. Uh, He continues. That said, since we know that war is paid for through the stolen money that governments extract from the working masses, we then know that that the profits of war are filthy lucre and are not the rightful property of those corporations, bankers, executives, politicians, and Trumanites who possess them. So let's face the facts. The filthy lucre of the state lies in abundance for those brave enough to walk into the dragon's lair and take it, but walking out of that lair with the gold requires more than bravery. Uh, And he continues uh, just a moment later on. Uh, Quote, stolen money in the possession of thieves, robbers, crony corporations, crony executives, crony bankers, politicians, and other such scum as unowned property and available for rightful homesteading. Uh, End quote. So as far as funding, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the uh, uh, what, what Ben proposes. Uh, you know, if it's uh, rapists, thieves, murderers, uh, anything they have is not, uh, you know, justly acquired, right? 
Uh, so that's uh, how you would, you could fund a committee of vigilance or, uh, you know, fund an individual vigilante. So uh, what do you think? Well, I think I need to mention two things. One would be, of course, the comic book fictional artistic thing. And then there was more of a real life version of it regarding the the funding uh, question. So let's let's deal with the fictional one first. The only real fictional superhero that was really more of a vigilante, not Rorschach, was actually Frank Castle, also known more commonly as the Punisher. Now, the Punisher was actually very interesting. So here you have a guy who actually is in many ways more similar to Rorschach than he is to Bruce Wayne. So all three of them are normal men. They're not mutants, not aliens, et cetera, et cetera. So they're not metahumans by any measure. However, Frank Castle is more similar to Walter Kovacs or Rorschach in that both of them were not rich like a Bruce Wayne or Oliver Queen. So this kind of raises an interesting question. Like, how do you pay for everything, right? Now, Rorschach didn't really have an answer to this question. He was just more kind of like, act like you're homeless and you'll get by scraping on. You know, there's an infamous scene in both the comic book and the movie of The Watchmen where he's eating a cold can of beans, okay? Like, the guy's scraping by, and he's okay with that, at least to some extent. That's So Rorschach didn't really have an answer as far as that goes. I mean, I guess you could say maybe dumpster diving, uh, but that's not really funding really much of anything. And, of course, Rorschach stuff was all very improvised and just grabbing kind of whatever was lying around. And so he was very good at MacGyvering stuff, but, again, not answering the question about fun, about funding. By contrast, Frank Castle did have an answer to this. And it was not Bruce Wayne's answer, which is I'm going to use my family's well, you know, vast wealth, inherited fortune, and my multi, you know, um, you know, multi-billion dollar business to basically finance all my bat gadgets, like the bat plane and the Batmobile and so forth, right? Frank Castle had a completely different answer from both Rorschach and Bruce Wayne, which was namely this. Frank Castle, most of the time, basically kills gang members. So what he would do is that he would take out, let's say, the Irish mob, and he would just kill everybody. I mean, the Punisher kills people. That's his thing. That's how he punishes. He punishes with death, okay? Uh, the death sentence, as it were, from the Punisher. Okay, that's that's Frank Castle's M.O. Wasn't there a wrestler that went by the name of the Punisher? That's, that's the only name that I know if that's if Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll, just, the... it's, it's, I'll go with Frank Castle because that, that's how he's <laughs> – even in the comics, well, he's referred to that more often. Don't don't cater to me because I this is uh, I'm I'm you're you're a fucking nerd, Kyle. I'm not. I'm no, I'm kidding. Oh well, but... geez, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I just I just never <laughs> like it's it's I've never watched Star Trek or Star Wars, and I've never you know really been into comic books, so I'm I might be kind of an outlier here, but you know I'm I'm enjoying the storylines, the plot lines, even though I don't know what you're talking about. But sorry sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. Speaking And speaking of a better version of, of Star Trek, I actually do want to mention Firefly and Serenity when I get a chance, because there actually was some vigilantism in that as well. But regarding Frank Castle and answering the question about funding, here's what Frank Castle did. What he did is that he would kill gang members, and he would just pretty much kill them all. And he was very good at it, because remember, he was actually a former Marine. That's actually part of his background story and part of the reason, at least depending which origin which version of the origin story you think is is the most accurate one his family was murdered because of his previous like spec ops experiences like what was it uh, marine recon or whatever it was called so the guy is basically former special forces former military and that's kind of his his skill set so he basically goes and kills gang members and what he would do is that he would take after they're all dead of course he would take their weapons their drugs and their money he would sell the drugs. So yeah, Frank Castle's a drug dealer. Okay, he would sell yeah, the drugs. Yeah. He would sell the drugs. He would never. He's not a druggie himself. Never. I mean, he's got to keep in peak physical condition, as he himself said and again a couple of the comics or whatever. Um, he would sell the drugs and profit the you know keep the profits. He wouldn't make more. He would just whatever he grabbed, he just sold it off. Um, he would uh, and then he would use the money both the cash reserves from the gangsters he took uh, plus the profits of the drug sales. And he would use it to buy ammunition as well as improve the weapons that he took from the dead gangsters. 
and then he would take those improved weapons and then of course you know his his normal expenses and so forth and he would then wash rinse repeat my friend he would go kill more gangsters and that's, and that's not, that sounds exactly like ben was kind of proposing there like yeah you know just uh you know go, ahead, go in and take it <laughs> no it is what well, wolfsterman used filthy lucre i think he said yep Okay, it is Frank Castle in, you know, the fictional Punisher series did the filthy lucre thing all by himself. Frank Castle is a, is is like um is a so-called superhero who's more of a vigilante because he ki- a he kills people and two the he answered the question about how do you finance yourself if you're not, you know, like like a Bruce Wayne or Oliver Queen type and it was just well, you kill the gang members, you sell the drugs, you buy ammunition, because for some reason, like even Frank Castle mentioned this like once or twice, for some reason the the gangsters have more guns than they do have have ammunition. So he would actually have to buy ammunition, but buy ammunition, buy upgrades, and and tinker with the upgrades. You know, get a more effective shotgun, for example, and then wash, rinse, repeat. Go kill more gang members, get their money, weapons, and drugs. Sell the drugs, use the money, and 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 the cycle just repeats, 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 repeats. So Frank Castle did have an answer to that funding question. Now that's the fictional answer. There actually was a real life answer as well, and this one's very different. Uh, there was a book report I did a couple years ago. It's, uh, it's uh, by a book called uh, To Break a Tyrant's Chains, neo Guerrilla Techniques for Combat, and it's a book by Duncan Long. Basically, in short, because this, this would easily be an episode by itself, because Duncan Long went in a lot of different ways about how to apply guerrilla warfare in our modern period, uh, and and really in first world industrialized countries, and more specifically here in America with a K. Duncan Long's answer to the funding question was simply this. Because of the Industrial Revolution and the incredible, uh, really unprecedented amount of profitability, even by individuals, Guerrillas, or as he would say, neo guerrillas, are in a very unique situation because the guerrilla, the guerrillas of the past, were usually poor peasant farmers like the ones that Mao Zedong uh, capitalized on during his communist revolution and all that, where you would have to have some portions of the peasant class still being like peasant farmers and basically providing all that support and material and food to the guerrillas while the guerrillas went off into the actual fighting. So there had to be a division of labor. Duncan Long says, said that no longer applies because of the profitability of the industrial revolution and, and mechanization and so forth. Each vigilante worker essentially could essentially self finance himself by just simply being a little bit more frugal and a little bit more mindful about where their money goes. But otherwise, because of labor saving devices and some other related things, can essentially finance themselves. And it wouldn't take a lot of money, uh, but because you can now, and Duncan Long didn't say this in his book, I'm just saying this more as an add-on, but because you can buy body armor off of Amazon, for example, because there is an even greater availability of tools that weren't available when Duncan Long wrote his book, uh, you know, back, I think it was back in the 90s, I think it was, um, I think that just kind of accentuates the point that I think Duncan Long's answer to the financing question is really just more, you know, be frugal with the money that you have, with the money that you earn with your income and all that, and just reallocate that towards being a vigilante. And there you go. Was so, kind so of having so so have that initial capital investment, and then you could still do the thing like filthy, filthy lucre uh, as as a funding mechanism. But okay, very very interesting, very interesting. I guess, I guess so, that would be another appro- I guess that would be another uh, third approach is just kind of combine the two: filthy lucre plus Duncan Long's you know frugality. Yeah, the the, the, the initial capital investment. Yeah, you no, know, exactly. But we are about uh, two hour two hours and ten minutes into this, and so so what I'm what I'm going to do here. Is what we'll we'll go into. There's there's one other section in uh, in this vigilante portion. Uh, how do you train vigilantes to use force? And I think that's a really important question to ask. So uh, you know, kind of a, a you know, seeing how the how the episode's going. Uh, so 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 guys, uh, we're we're gonna do one episode. It'll be a three part series, likely maybe a two part series. One on vigilantism. And then one on us or uh, vigilantism and uh, we'll do two two uh, we'll do uh, uh, two episodes. Uh, so one on vigilantism and then one on assassination politics and uh, avenging angels. So, um, so I guess let's go ahead and get into uh, I mean training vigilantes to use use force. I mean, 
we, we'll go back to Phoenix Jones here. He had, uh, you know, UFC UFC training, you know, mixed martial arts training, which uh, if you're going up against, I mean, his, his kind of, it seems like his favorite favorite type of person was, uh, you know, kind of the uh, the bar drunk, which still, you know, these people were, were very large. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be fearful to, to go up against them. So, I mean, uh, he, he kind of had that sort of, uh, you know, baseline training, but I'm sure d depending upon the scale, I mean, when we talked earlier about, you know, kind of start small scale, your common criminals, then up to, you know, the mafia and then the state eventually, uh, I mean, that'd be kind of the, the ideal goal. I mean, how do you, uh, <laughs> I mean, how do you train vigilantes to use force? Okay. The first thing to realize is that self-defense training is, has, is conceptually and practically must be different than the training that would be used to train like real life actual vigilantes. So I guess there I guess there was uh that thing up in uh Michigan, I think it was what Threat Management Center or whatever, where there was oh, kind yeah. of focused more on de escalating uh threats and all that. You know, uh vigilantes might benefit from some of that kind of stuff, maybe but I think it would have to be even more specialized and more intensive and, and in some ways even more varied uh, because self-defense training in general, whether it's martial arts or firearms or even psychological techniques like Threat Management Center does, the focus and the intent and more importantly the context of all of that is really focused on self-preservation. Vigilantes are not really that much concerned with self-preservation because otherwise they wouldn't be vigilantes, right? Vigilantes are essentially third parties who are acting on behalf of, the, of um, other innocent parties against a, a, a criminal, you know, coercer. Essentially, they're they're basically like a shield. Is really what vigilantes are, at least conceptually. So, intervening as a third party on behalf of other innocent victims is automatically very different from teaching a potentially future innocent victim themselves to use force. So the dyna so the context is completely different. Of course. And therefore, I would suggest the training uh, would also have to be uh, very different as well. Now, to go back to the RLSH folks, the real-life superheroes, so-called, you know, they... <sighs> I watched some of the tutorials that like one or two of them made, one of them by a Canadian, interestingly enough, not that that necessarily makes a difference, but there was definitely kind of an attitude of, well, when we go out patrolling, we're acting more like neighborhood watch. And I know like in the Batman mythos, there very much is like, oh, going on patrol and all that. But remember too, Batman also had the cases he worked on, kind of like a Sherlock Holmes thing. And Rorschach, never did the so-called patrols. He was always working a case, always working a case and all of that. So what's what's the training involved here? Well, I think that regardless of whatever particular styles of vigilantism are, are that, that the particular uh, vigilante decides to use or capitalize on their own strength, so to speak, I really do think that there has to be some sort of practical knowledge of use of force. Whether that takes the form of firearms, whether that takes the form of martial arts of any discipline, whether that takes the form of other things that uh, may not necessarily should be mentioned on a podcast publicly available, the fact of the matter is, is that um, there does need to be a practical knowledge of use of force in some sense. Because, of course, vigilantes are essentially conducting forms of punishment in the pursuit of justice. So now it's now coming down to a very – so in terms of their training, Shane, it's now coming down to a very utilitarian question of how do they conduct said punishment? You know, how do they stop the actual uh, you know, criminals, whether it's a mugger or a gang member or whomever else, right? So you know, it, it's kind of like you – know, I, I guess the training really would have to be tailored to the specific individuals. Um, you know, If you have a vigilante who has stronger upper body strength and maybe boxing – uh, would be one type of thing they could kind of train at. Um, however, if you have somebody who has lower body strength, usually uh, women, although not always, kickboxing would, of course, be a little bit preferable, at least in some sense. But, of course, those are two different examples of martial arts. Um, but then let's say let's you go more the firearms route or something along those lines. Well, guns are noisy. 
and silencers are illegal. But then again, so is vigilantism. So maybe there's an opportunity there, maybe not. Um, as an alternative, which actually last time I checked is legal, uh, bows and arrows. You know, do it at Indian style, as some people and, would and, say. And let me and, and, let, and let me jump in here with uh, on the subject of you know on on guns. Uh, for a uh, for a, a vigilante, it might be uh, you know well worth the money to uh, get one of uh, Defense Distributed's uh, ghost gunning CNC machines. Um, you know, you can have a uh, you know ghost gun. Uh, you could have a, a bunch of ghost guns. Uh, you know, all sorts of uh, pistols with silencer, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, so that could be a highly valuable tool for for a uh, for a vigilante. Sure, and obviously with something like that, the the the, the anonymity plus, I guess, in some sense, disposability of those kinds of tools would be very appealing, right? Considering the very clan in what some what you could consider to be kind of a I guess you could say a clandestine nature of vigilantism itself, right? At least in some sense. Right. Um, and, and, and I don't know for sure. I mean you have got to make that initial fifteen hundred or two thousand dollar investment and then you can print the eighty percent lower uh, lower receiver for the AR and then and now uh, most recently uh, also pistols as well. Just kind of plug and play whatever one you're trying to uh, design. Uh, I don't know how much the rest of that kit would cost. Uh, I honestly just don't know, uh, but I, I mean, yeah, you you could definitely, you know, uh, uh, if you if you want to dispose after every single use, I mean, you, you I, I, if if you have that sort that sort of money, uh, why not? Well, let's also distinguish between tools and training, right? So the tools would be like that kind of stuff, right? Would be like the actual physical items you're going to be using, whether it be a weapon or 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 even something like a screwdriver. Uh, you know, that that kind of stuff kind of varies. Some of that's going to be based more on practical experience. Some of that's also going to be based on individual preference and so forth. Um, you know, there you know, there might be a vigilante who acts more like Nightwing in the sense where he's going to use like two short sticks in each hand, kind of mimicking. Um, I can't remember the name of the martial art, but it's what some of the uh, it was either the Filipinos or somebody else used where basically you're fighting with two short sticks. Um so there's that, um, I suppose, in terms of tools. But I would still say in terms of actual training, I do think some knowledge of criminology is kind of important uh, in, in the indispensable sense of the term important, because how are you going to find the criminals if you can't do basic detective work? Um, you know, I mean, good police work was usually was originally conceived of as just good detective work. Uh, but, of course, since the police, the government police, don't do very good police work, then I would assume that the vigilantes would have to kind of pick up the slack and actually do better police work than the police themselves do, right? So having some knowledge of criminology, having knowledge of following up on leads, analyzing clues, um, interrogating might, might people. Even, might even be useful, especially if it's going to be kind of uh, – well, I mean, since that's kind of a necessary skill, it might be wise – uh, for a vigilante to uh, be a private investigator, wouldn't you think? It would be or less. At, it would or be at least the skill set. Or at least the skill set. Yeah. Uh, at bare minimum, sure. Uh, I don't. I don't necessarily see uh, a problem with that. Other than, uh, you know, PIs are already looked on with suspicion already. So if you're going to do the whole secret identity thing, um, or dual identity, actually, was what the actual, which is the real life term, actually is. If you're going to do the dual identity thing, then um, being a PI may or may not compromise that. It depends how you handle it, although that's a discussion for another time because that's getting into the weeds on, on some things. Um, I will say this. At least having the skill set of a PI, I think, is, is the indispensable part, right? You have to be able to follow up on leads. You have to basically examine physical evidence, not in the <sighs> fictional CSI sense of it, but, you know, like – you know, can, can you like put two and two, you know, if you're at a crime scene, can you put two and two together? Can you at least, you know, make sense of some sort of physical evidence in much the same way that the fictional Sherlock Holmes did, but not necessarily to that, you know, incredible level of expertise, just even more basic clues, you know, kind of like, hey, the tire tracks are heading off in that direction. Maybe we should like follow it or something, right? Especially if it's muddier. I mean, like, really, it doesn't have to be like, you know. It doesn't have to be an Agatha Christie, you know, brain twisting, you know, mystery novel or whatever, but something like really, really basic. You know, you have to be able to do that kind of thing. Otherwise, you're just kind of hit running into dead ends. And then what? Then you can't work a case. Right. So I, I guess there's that is kind of like basic detective skills 
and such, being able to interrogate people, um, but of course not coercing them while you're interrogating them and so forth, because there is a tendency to do that, uh, both real world and fictional, unfortunately. Uh, let's see, what else, what else would they have to know how to do? Um, I would also say some degree of the skill set of like espionage techniques. Uh, there's all sorts of things where any knowledge of really doing any sort of undercover work, which actually overlaps with PI work, actually, most people don't know that, um, uh, of doing like undercover work, taking on, uh, taking on aliases, um, uh, having a legend, which is actually the real world term for a cover story, having a legend. Um, some people would say disguises, but that's kind of, that's kind of overrated, really. You just, you just need to kind of really more fit in with the environment, even if it's just like a simple, like, uniform, like a delivery uniform. Because if you think about it, Shane, I mean, who the hell pays attention to janitors? Exactly, At least, and, yes. So like, the ser service positions are the ultimate gray man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the idea is to really kind of go gray man here. Um, oh, and, and kind of related to this, too, is security culture. This should be kind of the, the duh of it. Uh, but yeah, vigilantes need to have excellent security culture given the nature of what they're doing. Yeah, so, so if you're going to have dual identities, you're going you're gonna to have your, 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 normal, your normal life, and then you're going to be, just say, Batman, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> sure, you, let's go with you that. Shouldn't, you shouldn't you know, go around and be like, <laughs> I'm actually Batman, dude. Yeah, that's me. That's me. You shouldn't do that, <laughs> I guess is the point. But of course, as a side note, the whole I am Batman meme is well now a meme, right? So if somebody goes around and they say, I'm Batman, you know, it's, well, it's kind uh, of a not, joke, not, right? Not, not even – like let's say it's, say it's uh, I don't know, Dr. Shock. I don't know. Just just some sort of <laughs> some sort of persona, some sort of vigilante that's gained popular popu – or oh, no, Phoenix Jones. Like Phoenix Jones. Like if he, if he – before he, you know, unmasked, if he just went around it's like, hey, I'm Phoenix Jones, motherfucker. That's, how, uh, that's what he originally did, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, security culture is important. You don't just go, you you, you know, uh, loose lips sink ships. I think is the is the uh, the the uh, the term here, or the I guess the 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 uh, the phrase. Yeah, you just yeah, keep yes. your mouth shut. Right, right, right. Um, and and then kind of more as a maybe not every single vigilante needs to be good at this, but at least some of them. If there's any sort of familiarity with either like computers, IT, or even a, a more uh, classical sense, like with engineering, uh, anything mechanical, uh, you know, building your own equipment, actually building your own tools. I mean, that's what Bruce Wayne does, right? Um, but also, or if you want to go more the Rorschach version of it, which is more being able to kind of MacGyver, you know, improvise gadgets and so forth, rather than build them from from scratch using the finest materials available. Either way, either way you're doing it, the expensive way or the really kind of shoestring budget way, uh, having any sort of like engineering aptitude is more of a is is more of an asset than not. Uh, being able to kind of make your own stuff, and there's also a security culture angle that angle to that as well. Because of course, yes, technically you could buy, as I mentioned earlier, you could buy body armor off of Amazon, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's but, uh, I'm sure they uh, kind of uh, watch who, uh, who who buys those things because you you don't buy you don't buy those as an avid hunter you don't buy like what are, are deer gonna shoot back at you? Uh, <laughs> you you don't buy those as just a normal person. There's a reason Dangerous you're buying fishing. those or like yeah. even if it's just for 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 a uh, for you know a bug out location or a bug out bag. Uh, I mean. Still, I mean, th th those are things that that you know that the state watches. I I can almost guarantee. Right, exactly, and and of course, anybody who's like familiar with with Am with buying on Amazon specifically, if you buy like like different types of like similar grouped items, they'll make Amazon because of their out because of the the algorithm that actually looks at each um, customer's you know profile and previous buying history and so forth. They'll actually make recommendations based on their algorithm that hey, you might be interested in X, which actually very well likely you very well might be interested in and so forth. Um, that can kind of pop up too. So you don't, you guys don't think that's available law enforcement, so-called? Really? You don't You're think really? the blue coats might I, have I a back door to that? I haven't, I haven't read Amazon's uh, privacy policy either. Uh, but uh, you know, with 95% <laughs> of companies nowadays, uh, they they keep that data for for advertising purposes, and they like to sell it off. And uh, you know, I'm sure there's some government agencies agencies that would be interested in buying that information. So uh, it should be common knowledge now. I mean, there's been so many data leaks. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that is pretty much, uh, you know, you kind of hear it's it's kind of like, uh, you know, the bludgies. It's kind of like a police brutality. It's like it's I'm so desensitized to it now because it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that I don't really even look into the individual individual case studies anymore. It's kind of like that with with all these data leaks. Uh, like just, stuff happens all the time. So. Uh, yeah, you don't think that government agents uh, or government agencies aren't interested in buying that information, or they just, you know, have a back door there, I guess, would be the the other alternative. But still, still, the, the point remains. But still, in those privacy policies, whether it's that particular company or even others, a lot of times they'll say something. For anybody who bothers to read the fine prints like yours truly does, they'll actually say things like, well, if there's a law enforcement investigation, we'll cooperate with law enforcement, and depending on the company – only if they have a search warrant, but then other companies in their private privacy policies say, even without a search warrant, we'll still cooperate with law enforcement. So that's kind of all up in the air, basically. So there's not like there's not like a typical habit. It's just it's depending on what the particular policy of that corporation happens to be. So so, so the point is, if you have the engineering and mechanical skills to build your own stuff. Uh, especially if it's going to be used in a sort of in the sort of nature that that would be used for uh, you know uh, vigilantism, might be wise and, and it may it would be definitely be a valuable skill if you can do that yourself. Right. Instead of instead of trying to get like the best deals on eBay for anybody who still uses eBay, uh, for, you know, try to get the well, best auction no, deals actually, on eBay and then yeah, that no. I, actually, I guess the deep web might open up some possibilities here. I honestly have never like I I, I go on the deep web to peruse sometimes because it's you know it's 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 fun, but. Uh, you know, I, I haven't looked. I'm sure maybe there's places where you can buy, you know, body armor with uh, with Monero and do it anonymously. That, so so maybe maybe there's some possibilities out there. I don't know for sure, but what I do know is 100% possibility is if you can make your own, you know, body armor, you're 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 better off privacy wise and security culture wise. Yeah, that that that's kind of that's kind of the 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 bottom line as far as that skill set goes. So regarding the question about how do how do normal people, or roughly approximately normal people, tr get trained so that they become competent vigilantes? Which I think was was more kind of the the implication behind that question about how can vigilantes get trained to use force and all that. Is that it has to go beyond just simple self defense training? Like yes, it ha it includes that, but that's that's like greenhorn Ricky recruit kind of stuff. I'm not I'm not you know saying self self defense training is worthless. I'm just saying. You start there, but you have to go more so, right? I mean, for example, I remember there was this one technique, and I'm not going to say how I learned about this, but I will say this publicly because I'm trying to illustrate a point here about self-defense versus actually being a vigilante. There's actually a technique that many of the special ops guys do where, you know, like in certain movies and all that, if uh, if like an enemy soldier, a sentry, usually a guard, is taken out, he's killed. You know how like one method that's kind of shown in various movies like a Rambo type thing or otherwise is that the hands will come from behind the the sentry and the knife will slice the guy's throat yep, uh, horizontally? Yep, yep, yep. That's actually wrong. That you're not ever supposed to do that because it just doesn't work because of reasons of anatomy and also the guy is not incapacitated. He can still fight while he's bleeding out. So there's actually very good reasons not to do that. Here's what you're supposed to do. Here's a fun freebie one I'll throw out to the audience. Here's what you're supposed to do. The coming from behind with the, that's good. The mistake was the angle of the blade what you're, and, and how you're using the knife. Because the knife is a good thing, but you're doing it completely wrong. Here's how you're supposed to do it. Don't go horizontal, go vertical. So instead of slicing across the throat, what you're actually supposed to do is take the knife plunge it down and you have to aim it right but you plunge it down kind of in that kind of like between their um like the clavicle like right where the clavicle kind of meets the uh throat or thereabouts plunge it straight down and depending if you can because the guy's going to struggle because he's dying with a knife right on like in the side of his throat kind of going into his throat but like from a side angle you plunge it down and then you twist it and if you can, especially if the knife has serrated edge on it, you pull it out and rip it out. So the guy bleeds out uncontrollably and he dies from it. That's what you're actually supposed to do is go – is plunge it in vertically, not this stupid slice across the throat stuff, which doesn't work. So that's what I'm saying. Learning how to use force is actually rather important, whether it's a kill technique or other techniques which are actually non-lethal.
Right. And I'm saying, and I think vigilantes need to be familiar with both, at least to some extent. And 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 also keep in mind too. I know in this episode, I know I've been mentioning a lot of fiction, and and so forth. But again, that's because to reiterate it one more time, art imitates life, life imitates art. However, that being said, art will get a lot of real life stuff wrong, uh, either because the uh, the writers and artists or whomever creating the fiction just didn't have any practical experience or didn't have like a consultant they that they would usually work with to help like make it realistic or whatever. And thus they would get some things wrong because they're just borrowing from tropes, like a Rambo type thing. Um, and so the real life stuff really gets kind of skewered. So like even something as simple as taking out one enemy sentry from behind gets it halfway right, approach from behind, use a knife, but then they get the actual attack completely wrong. Like the angle of the blade is completely wrong and it does make a difference <laughs> in terms of effectiveness. So I would just say this. If people do want to start kind of training to be vigilantes or they're kind of thinking about it, at this point, you know, being familiar with like real life plus the fictional stuff, I would just say this. If you're actually going to really do this for real and risk your neck for whatever reasons, uh, please, please, please don't use comic books with superheroes so-called in it as as kind of like a training manual. Please don't do that. Um, I mean, maybe some novels might have some inspiration, especially if it's like a neo-noir or like film noir type gritty private detective story type thing, which is more grounded realistically, and they kind of have to be. Sometimes there might be some inspiration from that, even though a lot of it tends to be kind of, you know, fantastical for other reasons, right? Like coincidences. Oh, we happen to show at the same location at the same time type of thing, right? That happened in some Philip Marlowe stories, by the way. Um, but I, I would just say this. Really, you need to get some practical experience if you're going to do that kind of thing and practical training. And I think one place to start would be really learning criminology. So that's like all the detective skills. That's the more intellectual stuff. And and also like, you know, a little bit of forensics here and there, maybe not a lot, but also interrogation. You know, how do you actually work a case? And then I would say kind of another angle of it would be actually using force, whether that takes the form of martial arts and or like using guns or even even something like archery, right? Bows and arrows and such. So that, that's kind of what I would suggest kind of as a starting point is really getting a practical knowledge, a practical experience in those kinds of skill sets and then kind of developing it out from there.